Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our weekly Thursday session on Cerebrovascular and Skull Base Symposium from University of Miami. Uh, this is a weekly event. It is now our seventh session on these Thursdays. I'm Jacques Morcos, prof professor and co-chair of neurosurgery, otolaryngology, director of vascular and skull base surgery at University of Miami. Uh, I am delighted to have as my co-directors for this series of symposia, Carolina Benjamin, assistant professor specializing in brain tumor and skull base surgery, director of our Keynes lab, Michael Ivan, assistant professor in our department, director of the research of the UM Brain Tumor Initiative, specializing in brain tumor, skull base, and epilepsy surgery, as well as our, my two open and endovascular neurosurgeons, Bobby Stark and Eric Peterson. Those of you who have not had the pleasure to visit Miami, here is a picture in the top left, the medical complex, you can see it in your top right, and our two main hospital, University of Miami Hospital and Jackson Memorial Hospital, we're obviously a high volume tertiary referral center uh, regionally and internationally, and of course, a very busy place committed to clinical research and educational missions. Uh, this is the link. You probably know it since you're with us on the symposium here tonight. You can access the entire planned series of talks for every Thursday as well as every Wednesday, as I will, the one that uh, Mike Ivan, my partner, is running. I'll show you that in a second. We've already done this first page and now we are here today on July 2nd at the 7th session. Uh, and these are the others that are, we are planning well into September and more will appear soon since it doesn't look like, unfortunately, this COVID situation is going to solve itself anytime soon and everybody's hungry for virtual education. Um, to give you a teaser for next Thursday, Next Thursday also is a debate format on paraclinoid aneurysms, endovascular versus microsurgical clipping. We'll have Giuseppe Lenzino debate Jorge Mura from Chile and uh, with a, a fantastic uh, group of panelists, Aaron cohen Gadol, Amir Dedashti, my partner Bobby Stark and Babu Welsh. So if you're interested in vascular, please join us next Thursday. And as of next Wednesday and every Wednesday, uh, this is Mike Ivan's symposium, which I co-direct with him along with Carol uh, Rick Komotar and Carolina Benjamin. We have a fantastic speaker, Mike, uh, invited uh, Alfredo Quinones uh, Hinojosa from uh, Mayo in Jacksonville, who will talk about awake brain surgery. Uh, 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 we call him Q, everybody knows him as Q. He's, he's a spectacular, dynamic speaker, please don't miss it if you are interested in that subspecialty. I'd like to thank our group here, Ingrid, Roberto, Cristina, Ignacio. Ignacio is running this uh, symposium every week for all of us. Thank you to all of them for all the work behind the scenes to make this happen. This is how you can connect to our website at the University of Miami and see the series of symposia we're offering. If you've missed symposia, all of them are recorded. You can watch them there, both the Thursday and the Wednesday sessions. Uh, you can contact our training center, Ingrid. You can see her email. You can contact me by email or on Twitter, or you can, cont uh, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter as a department as well. Housekeeping instructions. I know you will have lots of questions. Please type them in the Q&A box. We will address all or most of your questions after the speakers and after the panelists have shown their cases and we will hopefully generate some heated discussions. We are not offering CMEs. Please share the links with your colleagues if you think these are useful to watch so that they can watch us and, uh, next time. Um, I will remind our two main speakers about two minutes before their 25 minutes that uh, they're nearing the end, just to make sure we have time for everybody to speak. Now the best part, I get to introduce the people who are here today. 
so for panelists and Mike Link, professor of neurosurgery at Mayo Clinic in very sunny Rochester, Minnesota. Mike is a friend for many, many years. Actually, he was uh, Mike Ivan's guest two weeks ago talking about quality of life for acoustic neuroma surgery. And it is a delight to have him as a panelist with us today. Fred Telishi, my partner, professor and chair of otolaryngology, University of Miami, unfortunately had a last minute commitment. He cannot join us, but Scott Clifford, the neuro uh, otology fellow who works with him will fill in for him and present the case that Fred was going to present. I've, not, I've worked with Fred for about 25 years now. The other Fred and Frederick Barker, a fantastic friend of mine for many years. He and I have uh, worked together on the SPC of AANS for many years. It is wonderful to have Fred, certainly one of the smartest people I know, professor of neurosurgery at the Mass General Harvard Medical School. And uh, thank you, Fred, for joining us and uh, keep, uh, keeping us on the straight and narrow here. And last but not least, another brother of mine, and that's Greg Thompson. Greg is professor of neurosurgery, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Greg did his fellowship with Bob Spetzler the year I did mine, and we've been, uh, the year before I did mine, and uh, the, we've been friends uh, all this time, 20, more than 25 years. Greg, wonderful to see you virtually. Now, our two main speakers for today. Marco Tatajiba, Professor and Chairman, Department of Neurosurgery, University of Tübingen in Germany. Marcos is Brazilian and German. He got his MD at the University of the State of Rio de Janeiro. He did his residency in Hanover or Nordstadt with uh, Majid Sami, who of course is known to everybody. He obtained his PhD in 1992 and his habilitation in 1998. He was a research fellow at the University of Zurich with Professor Martin Schwab. From 98 to 2002, he was at the Hanover Medical School and the International uh, Neuroscience Institute in Hanover with uh, Majid Sami, then left to go to the University of Freiburg for two years and has been at Tübingen since 2003, where he has built up a spectacular neurosurgical program uh, by the way, none of our speakers, I, have, I really have no time to list their awards or anything like that. That would be pages and pages. Certainly that applies to Marcos, who also is a prolific writer with more than 360 peer-reviewed publications and a friend of mine for many years. You can see his city, where he's from. You can see a few people in his team. Uh, uh, this is how I remember him at the bottom left when... I was a fellow in Gainesville with R. Day and he visited. He had a couple more hair follicles at the time and uh, uh, he's made a tremendous contribution and continues to make tremendous contribution to the field, particularly acoustic neuroma surgery. So, and the next and the second speaker of the day is again, John Golfinos, who was a chief resident when I was a fellow at the BNI uh, with Spetzler. John is Joseph. P. Rensohoff, Professor and Chair, Department of Neurosurgery, member of the Neuroscience Institute uh, at the NYU School of Medicine, and of course, current president of the North American Skull Base Society. Uh, as John says, he is a child of the concrete because he was born and raised in New York City. He obtained his AB Biology at Princeton, MD in Columbia in 1988, did his residency in Phoenix at the BNI, when he, where he graduated in 95. He's been at NYU since then. He is the co-founder of the NYU NF2 Center about, among his many other accomplishments. He's been chair there for 11 years, president of NASBS currently. Um, there are many, many adjectives to describe John. Among them, for sure, he is a team builder extraordinaire. I mean, the people he has surrounded himself with at at, in his department uh, are legendary themselves. And on a personal note, I must say, John is certainly one of the quickest and most erudite minds that I personally know. Uh, he will make you feel very small if you have a conversation with him about any topic. 
so John, uh, here he is doing one of the things he does best, that's to operate. Um, here he is with his uh, colleague, Tom Rowland from Neuroautology, with, with whom I believe he does most of his acoustic work. Here he is enjoying one of his uh, outings in the bottom left, and I'm sure he will want to invite you to come to his meeting, the NASBS meeting in February in Atlanta. And I'm sure we would, have, well, I'm hoping we would have defeated COVID by then. Most importantly, it's his birthday today. So John, very happy birthday. So if he has to leave us a little prematurely, he certainly is excused to do that for good reason. Now I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna ask John to share his screen and to begin his talk and to unmute himself. Oh, Jacques, I mean, that is uh, uh, quite the introduction, I have to say. Um, and for those of you who have not had the pleasure of being a resident when Jacques Moore. Uh, John, um, we're losing your, your uh, Wi-Fi. We're not hearing you. Ship of all the nerves. So that is actually how I got started. Um, I love this topic. I'm very glad to be here and to discuss it. Um, it's one of those topics that uh, uh, we could go on probably for hours and I'll try and do it, do it justice in uh, just 25 minutes. Uh, you heard it already, all these things. I'm very proud to be the president right now of the North American School of Aviation Society, mostly because I've been, uh, I've been led in that job by both Jacques Morcos and Mike Link uh, and just a tremendous uh, array of talent before me. Um, and for team builders, the, the great thing about the NASBS is it's actually multidisciplinary. So it's both ENT and neurosurgery and radiation oncology and plastic surgery and ophthalmology. It's the only meeting I go to that is, that is like that. These are my disclosures. I am a consultant for the Major League Baseball Players Association, which has gotten very interesting recently over all of their um, discussions. Uh, I may at some point say gamma if instead of saying stereotype of radio surgery, excuse me for not using the generic terms. It's a little hard. I may also say Xerox or Kleenex. I have a tiny stake in surgical theater. Uh, I have another, and please, you're, you're very free to visit my Sunshine Act website. I have another disclosure. I'm usually in the position of um, giving the other side of this debate um, in favor of surgical resection, but how do you say no to Jacques Morcos? I haven't figured that out yet, so here we are. Uh, so I, and I, I suppose I, I've agreed to give the uh, other side in the theory that um, a good mind can hold both sides of the debate at the same time. Um, so, and further on that, uh, borrowing from Shakespeare, I would say as a result that some are born with topics, some achieve topics, and some have topics thrust upon them, which is what happened to me today. And also, I have another disclosure. I have a gamma knife, and I'm not afraid to use it. It is, of course, the ultimate in conservative approaches, especially when you're talking about vestibular schwannomas. Uh, just to remind us what we're looking at, and, and to remind us that the MRIs have gotten so good that we can see often in exquisite detail uh, the nerves in the canal with the eighth nerve, both components behind, and the seventh nerve in front. Um, and now, you know, combining this with sagittal and with coronal views, you really can see all the anatomy that you need to see. Uh, this is, of course, from Rotan's book. Every time I give a talk, I still mention uh, Dr. Rotan because he was a profound influence in my career, um, and uh, his con contributions to neurosurgery are, are legendary, and you're looking at one of them. Um, so, Let's just clarify the debate. Um, let's not talk about small and medium-sized tumors today because I think that debate has somewhat been settled. Um, this is our paper that we uh, wrote in Journal of Neurosurgery in 2016, which was our match cohort comparison. And it was my own patients, both the ones surgically treated and the ones treated with uh, stereotactic radio surgery. These are all tumors that were less than 2.8 centimeters. So that's not gonna be, that's a whole different debate, I think, as far as we're concerned. Today, we really wanna talk about the large tumors and here's why. Um, this shows you our flow chart for that, for that study, how we picked out the cases. We started with 478 patients who did not have NF2 and uh, whittled it down to the appropriate ones. And then we matched up the cohorts very well. If you look on the right there, you can see that they are uh, as, poss as closely matched as we could possibly make it. And when you do that, you find out that, um, that uh, microsurgery and gamma knife, at least over the period of 108 months, um, which is quite a bit of time, uh, both provide excellent tumor control. And then you find out that no matter how good your surgery is, and I thought ours was awfully good, um, these are the microsurgery results over here. These are the house Brackman ones. These are ones and twos together. Uh, these are threes and fours. But look at the radiosurgery results. They will always be better. 
uh, no matter how good a surgeon you think you are, uh, and superior hearing preservation after gamma knife, at least in the beginning, this is the microsurgery curve. Uh, you can see it deteriorate, but at five years, at 60 months, the two curves cross. So that radio surgery, our radio surgery patients have lost uh, hearing past the five-year point, whereas the surgery patients have not, and it remains stable. Those who retain hearing. Um, and then the complications obviously are always higher for microsurgery than radio surgery. If anybody ever tries to do this as a randomized trial, I promise you it will look even worse than this as, as you carefully and prospectively uh, write down all of the complications, none of which really happen with radio surgery. Um, so the point of that study was that if we're really going to talk about small and medium tumors, then um, we probably should talk about gamma knife just as much as we talk about uh, microsurgery, since gamma knife offers uh, similar intervention-free survival rates provides excellent uh, tumor control, provides better preservation of the facial nerve, and provides better hearing preservation, at least during the first five years post-operatively. Uh, this, this is before they built a new hospital. You're looking at our, our hospital from the East River. So the river's down here, and during Hurricane Sandy, the river was up here. So you can imagine uh, what kind of hurricane that was. So you can't get on a panel like this where Mike Link is there, and Greg Thompson's there, and, and Professor Tadegiba is there, uh, and not mention this. This is the original pan qual, the original paper from the University of Pennsylvania on their um, pan acoustic neuroma quality of life, the so-called pan qual study. And if you look at the various uh, colors here, I can tell you that the blues are the non-tumor controls. These are the different domains that they that they examined. How do you feel about energy? How, how do you feel about your hearing, your balance? Uh, in general, how do you feel? And you can see that in every case, microsurgery, the dark green bar, kind of suffers, uh, except in general, which is sort of fascinating. Um, and, but in all the other domains, microsurgery suffers, especially compared to radiosurgery, and compared even worse than that compared to observation. Um, so that said, I can tell, let's talk about the big tumors now. I can tell you that um, we, just, we just graduated our last fellow, Nicholas Deep, who did an outstanding job over two years. He's going down to the Mayo Clinic um, in Arizona, in Scottsdale, uh, where he'll join Bernard and Doc. Uh, he's a terrific fellow, and he looked at our results. He's, he's uh, putting them out now. That over the last five years, our actual results in terms of gross total resection is different than the five years prior to that. So our rate of near total resection has climbed along with our rate of patients that uh, then received gamma knife on a delayed basis. And that's to be expected, even though we've been doing gamma knife since 1997, it, it, we were much more aggressive 10, 15 years ago in giving everybody a gross total resection. Uh, and now that we've, we've sort of gotten a little bit away from that, um, you see that the number of our patients that received gamma knife post-operatively has gone up actually. And I can tell you that uh, if Doug Kronzioka, who is my faculty member, were on this um, panel, he would tell you that the results are all outstanding for patients treated with gamma knife, even after surgery. Um, and the other thing that's changed is that my own, my own personal willingness to create any facial weakness whatsoever has declined. Uh, gamma knife remains immensely effective. That hasn't changed. And to me, if we're going to have this debate, then we should sort of decide ahead of time, are there cer certain tumors in certain patients where we can at least select them out for being really aggressive? or certain tumors in certain patients where we should from the outset say, this is the case where we really wanna try and be a little bit more uh, conservative. Um, so here's an example. This is a 56 year old gentleman. Um, you can see that his tumor has a cystic component that projects into the fourth ventricle. Uh, this is what it looked like at the time of surgery. Uh, it's one of those yellow soft tumors, uh, kind of tumor that I really hate the most. Um, and this is a post-operative study. You can see I was able to pull that cyst out of the fourth ventricle, um, but this is the contrast. You can see there's a little bit of contrast that remains basically along the course of the facial nerve um, because this is just too much of a tumor to, to hope to get every last little bit off that facial nerve. That yellow sticky tumor just stays there. Uh, and this is me stimulating the facial nerve through the cyst wall on the brainstem. So if you go back, I left some cyst wall. Look at it here. I left some cyst wall right against the brainstem because to peel it off, would have put the facial nerve in, in uh, danger. Um, and so that, that's what that looks like at the time of surgery, stimulating the facial nerve there. Um, another example, and, and these are actually both, that gentleman had also received gamma knife before he failed, uh, not by us. Um, but this is a 55-year-old Cypriot nun, Greek Orthodox, of course. Uh, and she had a 10-year history of left-sided hearing loss, which accelerated rapidly when she developed facial sensory symptoms as well. She had a very large cystic left side vestibular schwannoma, and her first resection actually was in Germany uh, in July of 2016. Uh, I think it was Professor Semi, I can't remember, maybe Marcos will know. Um, in November 2016, she had a second subtotal resection. Uh, the first resection was subtotal, the second was subtotal in, in uh, Cyprus, which was sort of interesting that they tackled this very challenging tumor. 
Uh, and then in December, they sort of uh, gave up and did fractionated stereotactic radio ther therapy. She went to Germany for that and got five fractions. Uh, so not fully fractionated, but the, the subtotal cyber knife sort of scheme. Um, so when she came to us, uh, in two, actually these are the ones from 2016, was before this tumor was, uh, had been touched, this is the first time. Uh, and then this is the post-op from then. So they left uh, quite a bit of tumor. Actually, I don't know in Germany where this was done, to be honest. Uh, and in October, um, the tumor recurred already with a cyst. And the post-op from 2017 looks like this. Again, the sort of small nugget that was left. And now she came to us with the recurrent uh, big cyst. Uh, that's what it looks like. And the hard part about this is facial nerve is between these two cysts. Uh, not a great situation. Uh, and as I got in there and stimulated on the, the surfaces of the cyst, there's the facial nerve right between the two of the larger cysts. And this is the post-op. Again, I have to leave this, this remnant here along the course of the facial nerve. That's where you always see it, um, just because we, we just didn't want to hurt her. That's her fifth nerve up there. That's our fat graft. Uh, and that's her. And then in a different case, uh, this is a 28-year-old um, uh, woman. And again, this is a large, uh, looks like it's going to be a soft tumor with all these uh, sort of lumps and bumps on the edges and the and the uh, darkness in the middle, but this is a young person. She's 28 years old. And this, this is earlier on in my resection career, uh, back in 2005, and there's a real lesson in this one. It depends on who your otologist is. Uh, this was not Tom Rowland, who I've done probably 98% of my cases with. Um, uh, this was an otologist who just didn't provide the, um, the full drill out and exposure we needed. Um, he's, you know, it was a trans lab approach at his request, and I, I happen to love that approach, so that was fine with me. But you really, there's, there's a difference between a good trans lab and a bad trans lab. And the main difference there is your ability to access all the tumor. Um, but I learned a lot from this case. So this is a pre-op from November of 2005. Uh, and this is a 28-year-old. She had not had kids yet. And now she's had three children, I believe. Um, she, uh, you can see the tumor here, it's a dark tumor. These are usually favorable in my hands. It's a smooth surface, dark. So these are the more firm tumors um, that I like to take out. Uh, in, but in, you can see what was left behind. We were getting facial nerve stimulation from it. Uh, early on in the case, I don't even think we found the facial nerve here at this point, but still we were getting facial nerve stimulation. Uh, the whole case did not go well. And so there I am in 2006 and I back out thinking that, um, that uh, you know, the chance to try again at a future date is probably the smartest and kindest thing I can do for this uh, young woman. Um, and so this is our fat graft, that's the remnant of the tumor, and I'm thinking, well, I'll be going back in on this one pretty soon. Um, here she is, uh, eight weeks post-op. You can see that I got to it. There's no change in the, the good thing about the trans lab, even on a big tumor like that, no change in the um, hemisphere at all, no T2 signal. And here she is at two and a half years post-op. Here she is at six years post-op. Uh, what dose of gamma knife did we give? Zero. She did not receive any radiation. She got nothing. Um, so this is a self-regressing tumor post-surgery. Uh, here she is in 2018 now. This is what's left of this remnant. Uh, she is, she, as I mentioned, she's had three kids. She has perfect facial nerve function, house grade one, uh, mostly because we didn't harass the facial nerve at all. Uh, and um, you know, this will be the unusual case. I fully expected that to go back in. But it shows you that being conservative uh, especially when dealing with a facial nerve, can sometimes be a gift. Um, and that just so you can see the 12-year comparison. So this is post-op. This is now um, pretty impressive for a tumor that received no radiation. And this is her trigeminal nerve, so you can see it. So um, a difficult position to defend. So a difficult position for me is trying to do these things while the patient is sitting somewhat upright. Uh, so Marcus, I had to I have to talk about this. This is a uh, one of the papers um, from your group, uh, and it was a critical comparison. This was actually a spinoff of the large study on um, nimatop, on nimotapine, which I thought was a great paper. Um, I was sort of amazed that the nimotapine was given in a very elaborate fashion. In the States, we give it, in, uh, you know, we break the capsule still and give it sublingual. Um, and the, you know, the way that it's done more in Europe is really with a lot of monitoring, with a lot of effort and a lot of resources. But nonetheless, they were able to do a randomized trial. And this was a subset of it, looking at whether or not um, positioning made a difference in those uh, surgeries. And uh, Dr. the group here reported, uh, Professor Tedegui's group reported that complete resection was obtained a little bit higher percentage in the semi-sitting position compared to supine, 90C versus 73%, but there's venous air embolism, um, bad enough to require terminating the surgery in two patients, 3.6%. And then just to show that, the, um, that there were better facial nerve outcomes, they were able to do, hold on one second here. 
they were able to do a two-tailed permutation randomization with 10,000 permutations of treatment choice and a propensity score that showed uh, either a tendency or significant results for better facial nerve outcome in the post-operative course uh, and a better extent of resection. So that, that I thought was very interesting, the two-tailed uh, permutation randomization. Uh, if somebody can explain to me what, on, what the heck that means and what kind of statistical uh, effect that is, I, I'd love to hear it. Maybe Fred can do it or Professor Teddy Giva. Um, and uh, just to show you that I know what I'm talking about, we did the same kind of statistical manipulation in our uh, match cohort comparison. We actually used propensity matching there. Um, so uh, you know, I'm guilty of the same crime, no doubt. Um, uh, this now, just to, to move on to a topic that is near and dear to my heart, Professor Tadegiva has written about this, um, which is whether or not um, heart, uh, round, firm tumors are better to operate on than soft ones. This, to me, is an ideal tumor. It's nice and round, perfectly smooth edge. When we look at the T2, it's a dark tumor. You can see the brainstem pushed away in proportion. Uh, our fellow Nicholas Deep, who I mentioned before, um, has written a paper showing, it's about to be published if it wasn't already, showing that the extent of, of um, projection beyond the anterior lip of the IAC was predictive for us and whether or not they had a good facial nerve outcome. This one doesn't go past the anterior lip of the IAC at all. That means the facial nerve won't be that distorted. Uh, that sixth nerve going by right there, of course. Um, and, and this tumor doesn't extend that far into the IAC either. So it's sort of a perfect tumor for resection. Um, we recommended a translab approach. He was told by other surgeons in New York that that's like trying to build a ship in a bottle um, because they're coming this way. And she, they, she was told that the retrosigmoid approach, um, uh, hearing preservation would be a miracle, but we're in the miracles here at, at the place where she was told that. Um, and just to show you what her, what her preoperative hearing was, she had an 8% speech recognition. So I think hearing preservation in this case would have been spectacular uh, to say that uh, 8% or to preserve her hearing at a useful level after that. Uh, she was an accountant, so she provided us with her hospital bill. Um, so this, pro so Professor Tadagiba wrote this, uh, and by the way, I learned this technique of using other people's um, publications when, when um, uh, Jason Sheehan and Fred Barker used my own papers against me. Um, so uh, please, this is, I find this interesting in, in what, we, what we say. Um, but they looked at 140 cases looking at the radiologic and clinical features. And I got to say that your conclusions were actually the opposite of ours. Um, that the consistency of the vestibular schwannoma has an impact on the immediate post operative outcome. You looked at the widening of the IAC as the only significant thing that came out of, uh, of the factors you looked at. Uh, I'm curious if you looked at the extension beyond the anterior lip of the IAC. Um, but also T2 imaging intensity was not uh, correlated. That was actually true in ours. Um, but in our paper, the, it was the harder firm, the tumors that were graded as firm during surgery that had better facial nerve outcomes, whether it's in, whereas in your case, you thought that soft tumors had better facial nerve outcomes. And the reason I'm bringing this up in, the, in what we're talking about now is that it's important if we're going to decide when to be conservative or not. If it's a tumor that you go in ahead of time thinking, I'm going to get all this one out, I don't doubt it, then you tend to keep going a little bit further, uh, thinking that perhaps the, the fault is on your side rather than the tumor side. Whereas when it's a soft tumor uh, with poor contours, you realize ahead of time that maybe this is not the tumor to be aggressive on, and maybe this is the day that I will be conservative in order to save that facial nerve. Um, just to show you that it can be ridiculously aggressive, this is a 52-year-old right-handed woman who presented with tinnitus, was told to watch and wait by reading the Acoustic Neuroma Association website. She progressed at growth past the chorus, chorus, and just to cut the story short before we run out of time, um, we actually performed a middle fossa approach on this woman. That's my verbose note showing you how conflicted I was myself. That I was actually going to take her to surgery in the day of Gamini. Um, the video is, uh, shows you the surgery there. And that's our typical exposure for, the, um, for a middle fossa. Uh, you've all seen that, so I won't, I won't go through that again. Um, but this is her post-op. This is the immediate post-op. You can see the temporal lobe gets elevated. Um, but it always comes back. It looks good in the long run. That's our fat graph there. Uh, this is the immediate flare. This is the delayed flare. You can see that all this signal goes, a lot of this is just blood in the epidural space. All that goes away and the temporal lobe looks great. Uh, and this is her audiology pre and post. And you can see that the curves are great. She retains her hearing. But I thought that in particular was ridiculously aggressive. Uh, just to show you, I can do it. This is our gamma knife after Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we had to replace it, of course. It was floating, it was floating away. This is our large Dalmatian outside the children's hospital. And what they've done for COVID uh, is they put a mask on the dog so that people are reminded to wear masks on 34th Street outside the hospital. This is the entry to the hospital. It's very, this is the new hospital. Um, they did a great job doing this and it served us very well during times of COVID because every room in this hospital 
every patient room, uh, all 320 of them are negative pressure a uh, single room. So they all were converted to COVID rooms uh, and every single one of them was full. Um, this is just to remind everybody that all tumors grow. Uh, we showed that in our group. If you do volumetric uh, studies on these tumors, Stieber schwannomas grow no matter what you hear from countries uh, like Denmark. They, these tumors all grow and it all, all, how is that possible? Well, it all hinges on your definition of growth. And if you are gonna operate on people, just remember that in the long run, it's still more expensive than treating them with radio surgery as well. And again, that's our main lobby. Uh, that's, these are actual views out the rooms for the patients out the windows. And I just want to thank you all for your attention. Um, I'll finish with this. So this is through the wonders of electronics. This is yesterday's case. So we operated on this 26-year-old gentleman um, yesterday morning. Um, and you can see that uh, this is the kind of tumor that I've described to you that I will dread. Uh, this is a soft tumor with dark areas. It's got multiple lobules. Um, and although you think these cysts are great, and yes, it does mean this will go from a large tumor to a small tumor quickly, it also means that at least in my hands, it's going to be difficult to dissect this away from nerves and, uh, and structures like that. Now, because he's 26, I told him preoperatively that we were going to be aggressive, that we were going to go really hard to take this out because leaving a remnant in a young man who is, is, leaves him with the risk of converting this to a long-term problem. Um, so we went in, I went in with the goal of being aggressive on this resection. Uh, and you, at, at times, you know, things change as you get in there. You can also see that it goes way past the anterior lip of the porous. We know the facial nerve will be a difficult one. Um, I thought the arachnoid planes actually were relative. Here's the darkness again on the scan. You can see how far posteriorly and superiorly it projects. We did this through a translab approach. So you, you're reaching back under, uh, at least in the beginning, you're reaching back under to get this part of the tumor and then you pull it in and all of it is easily accessible. I love the translab because it's the ultimate skull base approach. It reduces this distance. Instead of having to come from here to get to there, it reduces the distance to from here to there. Uh, so it really is the ultimate skull base approach. Uh, and then this is my post-op from this morning through the wonders of electronics. Um, and you can see a little dot of air there. It looks great, doesn't it? Um, and so you can see all of the tumor has gone there. But the truth is that at the, if you look really closely on this T1, right here is the facial nerve. And there's just a piece of this tumor on there that was just stuck and would not uh, come away. Um, so, but you know, you can always fool the radiologist. So I can put, show you, here's the radiology exam, uh, post-op translab resection, no evidence of tumor residual, decreased mass effect, extensive fat packing. Uh, and that was his presentation, hearing loss and balance problems, really balance problems. Um, but let's be honest, here's the, here's the facial nerve. Here's the remnants of tumor along it. This is fifth nerve, which is on top of the, uh, actually facial nerve was on top of the trigeminal nerve. They crossed. Uh, in the uh, coming off the brainstem, that's how large the tumor was. Uh, but yeah, there's tumor here. I, I had to leave some because this would not come away from the nerve. I um, mean, that's in the usual position as you come to the superior lip of the porous, that's where you're leaving uh, the remnant. So, uh, you know, that decision came because the facial nerve, uh, it, I didn't want to risk it at all, and the facial nerve was stimulating beautifully. Uh, the facial MEP, the motor evoke potential, that's the transcranial motor evoke, was unchanged. The only thing that changed was the threshold went from 130 to 170, but that's after five hours of anesthesia where he's under a deeper anesthesia. So we sort of expect that normally, but as long as the waveform and the amplitude looks good, we're, we're very happy with it. And they're very strict with us, I have to tell you. They have no problem telling us when they think uh, the facial MEP has changed. And I was able to stimulate the nerve right at the root entry zone at 0.1 with a very brisk response. Um, but this is, uh, uh, I think I have him in here. Let's see, let's see. Uh, oh, I wanted to show you his face post-op. Um, let me pull it up. Ah, it didn't make it in. Um, but he's the house three post-op. So, um, so the, despite our best, it was supposed to be right here. Despite our best efforts, um, that's what we see. And in, 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 you know, trying to be conservative and trying to save his facial nerve, this is sort of the worst possible outcome you can have, uh, where his face doesn't, doesn't look as good as it should. I'm very hopeful for him. I mean, I think he'll have this, this to me means he'll have a terrific recovery, um, but it'll probably at the best come to a house uh, grade two. And since he's weak now, he'll probably have some synkinesis. And for a 26 year old man, he'll notice it, uh, even if other people don't. Um, and that may affect, uh, you know, may affect him as he goes through life from here on that. That said, because it's a large tumor, we really didn't have much of, a, much of a choice with this thing. So those are my conclusions. We need to constantly evolve as surgeons. Um, the goal of surgery is gross total resection. Sorry to take the other side of the, the, uh, the debate, um, but that's subverted by facial nerve preservation these days. Um, and when I talk to my colleagues in cities like Zurich, I'm told that in Zurich, no one's allowed to have a facial nerve problem. Um, in New York, mostly no one's allowed to have a facial nerve problem. 
Um, but, you know, I think in a young patient, you really do uh, want to get as, as aggressive resection as possible and preferably a gross total resection. And remember that one man's near total resection is another man's uh, subtotal. And uh, you can fool some of the radiologists some of the time, but you can't fool all of the radiologists all of the time. So I thank you very much for your attention. And thank you again for inviting me to be on this very illustrious panel. Thank you, John. That was terrific. Uh, the, 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 this is a present to yourself on your birthday. This is really <laughs> nice. So uh, listen, and anyway, so you, whenever you need to leave later, please let us know. But thank you. That was Love terrific. You. So you, if you stop sharing your slides, and Marcos, if you go ahead and share yours. Let me get to the bottom of things here. Let's see. I'm in Zoom. Here we go. Yeah. And Marcos uh, can share his now. Okay, I'm not sure. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Marcos is loading his. Yeah, talk. you stopped my sharing. Yeah. And okay. unmute yourself, Marcos. Yeah. Yes, I, I'm. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Thank you very much, Jack, for for uh, your kind invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor to participate in this very famous symposium. Meanwhile, uh, it's uh, really very famous. And um, thank you for your friendship and uh, in, in all these last years. Um, I, I believe John and I, we, we share a lot of uh, um, uh, thoughts and, um, and philosophies. Um, Maybe there is a big difference between John and myself. He can speak much faster than I do. So <laughs> um, I try to do my best. Um, and um, Jack gave to me this uh, topic. Um, I, I'm not an aggressive surgeon, but I would like to show to you that um, in, in many cases, being more aggressive to the tumor will help the patient uh, better than uh, if we are too conservative. I have no disclosures and uh, I would like to start straight with this uh, case. This is a beautiful uh, lady nurse. She allowed me to, um, to expose to you her case, including the photograph. And um, she started with, a, um, with hearing loss 2010. She lived in another country in Europe. And um, this vestibular schwannoma of one and a half centimeters was detected and um, it was controlled once and uh, 2011 because of the tumor growth and she received gamma knife treatment. At that time um, she refused uh, surgery because she was afraid uh, concerning the facial nerve and uh, she received gamma knife treatment. And uh, she was followed up in the uh, following years, but the tumor presented further growth. And uh, 2014, she was uh, operated on, and um, a partial resection was, was performed. Uh, this surgery was done again elsewhere. And um, it was a partial removal, and uh, the tumor was controlled. And uh, in the uh, years um, after this uh, surgery, uh, the tumor uh, continued to grow and uh, she received a second gamma knife treatment, 2015. And, um, and then she was followed up again. And you can observe the tumor um, was growing and growing. And at this point, she had already two times gamma knife treatment and one partial removal. This was uh, the moment she contacted our department and uh, we discussed with her that this is uh, for sure a difficult case and we are gonna try um, maximal removal, trying to preserve the facial nerve. And um, so we could perform a near total removal. It was not a complete removal. You can uh, see here some contrast enhancement. This is tumor, this is not uh, uh, scar tissue, and, uh, and this is the patient right now. So we could preserve uh, the facial function. It was house Bregman too. And the problem is now this remnant is growing. 
and she's becoming desperate because there is an option of a third gamma knife treatment, but she is very much concerned. Everybody is very concerned. But another surgery for her would represent for sure uh, damage to the facial nerve. So now we are confronted with this problem. This problem is not solved yet. A similar case from the same country was this young man, the same age, and uh, she was a, he, he was a professional uh, clarinetist in, in, in one a famous uh, philharmonic uh, capital in Europe. And uh, because of his profession, everybody was afraid uh, the facial nerve could be damaged. Uh, this, of course, a very high risk in this case to produce at least some facial palsy that for him would be catastrophic. And, uh, but his mother was uh, with him and she decided for him to go for surgery because of his life and not only because of his uh, profession. And um, so we did that surgery and uh, fortunately the tumor could be removed completely. Meanwhile, four years. And at the beginning, he had the house Brackman tube. He couldn't play his uh, clarinet, but then with uh, a lot of training, he could uh, improve. And uh, so he came to, you can listen. Maybe you can recognize uh, this is girl of Ipanema because uh, he knows that I'm coming from Brazil and she, he played that for me. So what I want to show to you is that an initial conservative treatment can become more aggressive to the patient than a so-called aggressive treatment. So this patient here uh, did much better than this one. Meanwhile, this lady got serial MRIs and her problem is not solved yet. So this is what I, I want to show to you that uh, actually uh, the goals of surgery or goals of treatment should be the cure or stabilization of the disease and preservation of quality of life. Like this case, uh, the patient is cured, at, at least potentially cured, and everything is preserved. Young patient, another very young patient, 16 years old, large tumor, total removal, beautiful face, even some remnant of hearing, but it's not useful for her. And this other patient, very regular tumor, as John has uh, demonstrated in his uh, talk, complete removal, facial nerve is preserved. Of course, this doesn't happen every time. We do have facial palsy after surgery, here House Brackman 2 or even House Brackman 3 in this uh, very cystic tumor. These tumors, they represent more risk for the facial nerve if we try to remove everything. But this initial palsy doesn't mean permanent palsy. So what we observe in this series, uh, in, in our department, is without neurofibromatosis and, and, and primary tumors, non-previously treated tumors. You see, before surgery, almost all patients had House and Brackman grade 1, only 4% grade 2. Immediately after surgery, a lot of patients worse. Uh, they deteriorated. But over time, after three months, after 15 months, they improved a lot. So that in T1 tumors, all patients, 100% of the cases had Hausen Breckman 1 or 2. In uh, T2 tumors, 99%, 1% has had Hausen Breckman 3. In T3 tumors, you will see here, still we have more than 90% Hausen Breckman 1 and 2. For T4 tumors, the results are less good, but still we have uh, approximately 80% house Brackman 1 and 2. So what happens uh, immediately after surgery is a deterioration of the face. You see here all these cases had um, 
House Bregman 4 immediately after surgery, but the tumor is removed. But they developed House Bregman 2 over the following months and years. These patients, the same, large tumors, all of them developed House Bregman 4. Uh, nobody likes to see a patient with uh, such a face, but over time, they all improved to House Bregman 1 or 2. So the patient pays a price for this uh, total or near total removal and um, provided they don't uh, keep this facial palsy forever, this is something that uh, is very much accepted by the patients, this transient weakness. So the patients pay the price for this total removal and uh, in contrast, if uh, just subtotal removal is uh, done, as this very nice paper has demonstrated, the majority of the patients will have tumor recurrence or tumor regrowth, and they will need treatment afterwards. So ideal situation for sure is uh, total removal or near total removal in order to stabilize the disease. So these are the goals. But how can we achieve these goals? So in my opinion, the first thing is try to learn from people who can do it. Uh, I, I, I like this photograph. I, I did this photograph during the World Congress in Istanbul. Professor Yaja Gil, a pioneer of microsurgery, and Professor Sami, who was my teacher. I've worked with him for 16 years, and I learned a lot of tricks and tips. So learning from masters, visiting and working at large centers. If you really want to do this surgery, you must learn in, in a large center how to do it. And then develop your skills in the lab, in the surgical rooms. You must learn management, surgical indication, because even the surgical indication will influence your results afterwards. And then developing of approaches and try to explore uh, the approaches you are familiarized with. And uh, having the technologies, of course, interop monitorization and so on and but do not forget also um, uh, hemodynamic aspects of the surgery so blood flow well blood flow for the for the uh, nerves using papaverine or nimodipine during your surgery so vestibular schwannomas they can be very different sometimes they are easy to remove sometimes they are very difficult sometimes they are impossible it depends on the type and it depends on the aspect. This tumor here, although it's a large, is much easier to remove than these here with very irregular borders. But uh, these here, cystic tumors, this is a very large one. This is a giant vestibular schwannomas and neurofibromatosis is a completely different situation. So these are uh, uh, our numbers. In the last 16 years, we have done approximately 1,500 uh, vestibular schwannomas, all of them via retrosigmoid approach. So this is our preferable approach. We almost never do translab or middle fossa approaches. There are another 300 cases uh, that are under observation or we have sent to radiation. So, in our department, we have a very strong focus on retrosigmoid approach. We do sophisticated electrophysiology, of course, and uh, we use very much, we like very much the sitting position for large tumors. I, I'm going to show that. And, um, and we try to take the hemodynamic measurements into consideration. So IOM, I think uh, everybody is familiarized. But I would like to stress the importance of facial MEP as predictor of uh, transient palsy after surgery. So for small tumors, supine position. For large tumors, semi-sitting position. But this is the real semi-sitting position with the legs uh, at, at least at the level of the head to avoid air embolism. So, so far we have done uh, almost 1,000 semi-city position in our senum and most of them for vestibular schwannomas. And here you can see the real numbers. 
in half of the cases, you don't detect any single bubble according to transesophageal uh, echocardiography. So using TE, in half of the cases, you have absolutely nothing. In the other half, you may detect bubbles. In 10% of the cases only, you may have decrease of CO2. Uh, otherwise, in no single case, in no single case, 0%, we had any kind of uh, hemodynamic uh, uh, collapse or something uh, negative for the patient. What we had is 3% uh, pneumocephalus that uh, needed to be um, uh, exchanged, uh, but without other problems for, for the patients. So why doing sitting position? It's not because we just like it, but it's really because there is uh, influence uh, to the results. So as John has um, uh, demonstrated, this paper we had published last year, showing that with semi-sitting position, you can increase your radicality of tumor resection while improving uh, the function of the facial nerve immediately after surgery and afterwards as well. So following this, te this technique, why is uh, the semi-sitting position so interesting? Because your uh, angle of attack is from below to above. It will give you more and a better visualization to these structures. You can visualize the facial nerve uh, very early different than if you are coming from above. And in cases like these, where the tumor is growing very much in this corner between the cerebellum and the pons, you don't need a translab approach to come to here. You just come from below to this corner and uh, it will facilitate a lot the surgery. So small, small video on that. Um, I hope the video is, is running okay. So you see here the exposure, and uh, we open the dura mater at the so-called uh, uh, tubing and line where we can identify the inferior border of the internal auditory canal. The first step always is opening the internal auditory canal. Only in that cases where the tumor is not growing inside or the tumor is giant covering this area, we have to debulk the tumor first. Otherwise, we start with the internal auditory canal, trying to identify the facial nerve from the beginning on, this will make the surgery much easier later on. So you can see here the lower cranial nerves. This is why I like uh, the retrosigmoid approach and the sitting position, because I can visualize these nerves very early. In translab, you are gonna see the lower cranial nerves at the end of surgery. It poses more risk for these uh, nerves. And then you can see here, we don't use bipolar, only if there is any arterial bleeding, otherwise we don't use bipolar. We avoid thermic uh, injury to these structures. We use a lot of irrigation, including irrigation with papaverin. We keep the middle arterial pressure between 80 and 90 uh, to provide a good perfusion to these structures. And then we combined, uh, CUSA with, uh, with uh, dissections, okay? So let me show you some case examples. Um, I, I, I'm gonna show you, first of all, a small tumor. We use the supine position, always opening the, the system uh, at the beginning of surgery, and then uh, opening the internal auditory canal as first step like this. When the canal is opened, then we, we, we start with the bulking of the tumor within the internal auditory canal first. I hope the video is acceptable. And then we start dissecting uh, the structures using this plane of cleavage uh, containing perineurium and also arachnoid tissue. And uh, for small tumors, this of course is much easier, but also combining this 
two hands technique in which we hold the tumor with one hand and dissect the structures with the other hand. So at the end, uh, when we have detected or, or dissected the whole tumor, we enter with the endoscope. Uh, in this case, the patient had a hydroglobulb. You can see here, we had to skeletonize the hydroglobulb in order to enter the internal auditory canal. So here with the endoscope, you can visualize the fundus as in the same way you do it with middle, with a middle force approach. It's the same thing, but you are coming from behind. And uh, the endoscope will allow us also to see single air cells that could cause uh, any uh, CSF leakage. So we close these cells with bone wax and with uh, fibrin glue. Now let's uh, go to another case. This is a, a larger one. This is a, a lawyer coming from another country. Um, she had this tumor. She was uh, discussing the option of uh, gamma knife uh, radio surgery, but because of her young age and uh, she wanna get married, have children, she decided for surgery as uh, attention for um, a cure of the disease. So we um, approached the tumor in, in semi-sitting position. You can see here uh, evacuation of the tumor within the canal, checking with the endoscope for remnant pieces of uh, tumor and uh, removing it in order to clean everything. Then we can recheck with the endoscope and when we have uh, cleaned this area, then we start with the bulking of the tumor at the CP angle and dissecting the structures. Here is the facial nerve being dissected. The cochlear nerve was dissected below. And this is the way we separate uh, the facial nerve and the cochlear nerve from the tumor surface. And um, at the end, we recheck again because we know that uh, she had some air cells opened. We can't see them under the microscope, but under the endoscope here. And then we can close them with uh, bone wax and muscle and fibrin glue. So this is the patient immediately after surgery with House Brachma 1 some hearing preservation, she got married, got the baby, and she's uh, potentially cured from this disease. Um, now a larger case, but not invading so much the internal auditory canal. So internal auditory canal was evacuated. I just would like to show you briefly uh, the dissection, even in such a tumor, which is bloody and disturbing, but you can, in sitting position, use a lot of irrigation and um, avoid the uh, bipolar use. And uh, you see here again, under irrigation, dissection of the structures. This is very well tolerated by the, by the nerves and, and by the structures. And you have all the time uh, your recordings, facial MEP, auditory brainstem implant, uh, auditory brainstem uh, evoked potentials, and, uh, and here the dissection can continue. And at the end, we could remove the tumor completely. And this is the patient three days after surgery with complete preservation of the facial nerve, despite the large size of the tumor. Other cases, large tumors, this is immediate post-op, immediate post-op, also a lot of cases, radical removal, so-called aggressive uh, management, aggressive management and preservation of the function. But as I told you, uh, in a number of cases, there is deterioration of function, but most patients will improve afterwards. 
as these patients here, I've demonstrated to you, they started with House Brackman 4, but they became House Brackman 2, even House Brackman 1. So I'd like to show this uh, um, series with uh, four years follow-up. Um, you can see here what, what we could achieve in these uh, cases. We had uh, a total removal was possible in 95% of the cases. In 5%, we didn't perform total removal. And in the cases we couldn't perform the total removal, you see there is a regrowth in three of 10 cases. That means 30% regrowth and much less than when we perform total removal. So the general hearing preservation was 59%, but as you can see in smaller tumors, hearing preservation is much better than in large tumors. In giant tumors, we couldn't preserve hearing in any patient. And house Brechma 1 and 2 in 93% in general, for small tumors is 100%. These results are very much comparable to the results after radiosurgery. In large tumors, we are worse than radiosurgery, but these patients here got their tumor uh, mostly removed and tumor control is much better. So uh, our complications, we had one mortality uh, patient who died because of uh, a thrombosis of the sinus after surgery and a lot of complications because of that. We had uh, six patients with uh, bleeding within the CPA. We had to uh, treat. At the beginning of our series, we had 11% uh, CSF leakage. With this technique of endoscopic closure of the opened cells, I demonstrate to you, we could uh, reduce these to 3%. So sometimes a subtotal or partial removal is the best uh, treatment indeed. So like in this case here, very young woman with House Brackman 2 before surgery, very large tumor. So we could remove the tumor, but not totally. This is a subtotal removal. We can see here tumor remaining on the uh, facial nerve. She had a palsy recovered to House Brackman 3, three months after surgery. I hope that she will continue improving. I don't know. But um, it was a very large tumor. More than that was not possible to do. So near total, in our opinion, is something like this. Very thin contrast area. This is subtotal removal with more visible contrast. This is a partial removal. Old patients with large tumor, we don't want to send primarily to radiation. We reduce the size and then we irradiate these people. Look, our series, what, what, what happens? In, in T1 tumor, we remove the tumor totally in all cases. In T2, in 1%, we perform subtotal removal, otherwise 99% total. T3, you see in almost 8% of the cases, we couldn't remove the tumor totally. And T4, in 17.5%, we did subtotal removal. So we became more conservative over time. But in general, we try to do a total removal. If you check what happens with the subtotal removed the tumors, in 40, we had 40% regrowth of this and only 6% in the group of total removal. And for T4, we had 36% regrowth of the subtotally removed tumor and only 2% after total removal. So, and these results are very comparable to the results published by the group of Nakatomi in GNS 2017. So I received this patient here telling me that there was a subtotal tumor removal and, um, and, and she showed me these two pictures. I had a difficulty to identify which is the post-op picture. But I, I, I give you a tip. You see here, there is a skin incision. So this is the post-op. So you can't see any difference, but this is the post-op. This patient uh, received the so-called uh, subtotal removal and was, um, it, she, she was told that she needs now a radiosurgery. 
So in my opinion, this is of course not a good treatment. This is not a conservative treatment. This is a more aggressive treatment than if you try to remove this tumor. Now, uh, just to finish my, my talk, I would like to show briefly a, a, a short uh, overview of the literature uh, in order to um, confirm what I'm saying, that uh, uh, total removals are better than uh, two conservative uh, measurements. So, total removal will give us much better chance of uh, stabilization of the disease. We have, of course, a much higher number of patients uh, recurrence-free survival. Um, the uh, function which is preserved after total removal has the tendency to remain preserved. And Mike Link has done this very beautiful work with a group of Mayo showing that uh, there is more patient satisfaction if the tumor is totally removed than if the tumor, if there is tumor remnant in there. Um, and uh, not only depending on the function of the, of, the, of the facial nerve, but the presence of tumor is disturbing for, for many patients. And uh, here again, this paper published in, in GNS 2017 with very long-term follow-up showing the numbers. Um, this paper in Laryngoscope 2016 showing that uh, patients having um, subtotal removal, they have 13 times more risk of developing recurrence than totally re removed the tumor. And this is the conclusion of this other paper here. In young patients, uh, total removal must be the goal in order to uh, save other problems uh, to these patients, as I have demonstrated with the first case in my presentation. And uh, this paper of Massoni showing the stabilization of the function over time in the majority of the patients after total removal of the tumor and uh, the paper of Dr. Link, uh, which is for me uh, one excellent uh, paper published on this, on this field. So maximal surgical resection should be the goal. This uh, is uh, our opinion as well. So in conclusion, um, I, I believe uh, gross total removal is the best option. We must fight for that. Of course, this is not possible in all patients. We have to recognize when it's not possible and then in those cases uh, avoid uh, too much damage. And my last slide, I would like to say that not only uh, we um, are trying to improve the quality of life of the patients by doing good surgeries on them, but also educating our people. I'm very proud uh, to have had uh, excellent people who learned this technique and uh, many others are coming. And uh, I think this is also our duty uh, to teach others to do uh, this kind of surgery, avoiding the problem of uh, subtotal removals just because people don't have the knowledge to do that. So it was a great pleasure and honor to be with you. I thank you very much. Thank you, Marcos. That was fantastic. Uh, exactly as we, you know, what we wanted to hear. Thank you very much. So I'm going to move on and ask Mike Link to share his slides and uh, share his wisdom. And unmute his. There we go. Can you hear me? And yes, sir. See my first slide there. Let me get in presentation mode. Yeah, both those presentations were really excellent. Um, thanks very much. And I'd be anxious to get some uh, advice, actually, for a patient I saw just last week um, with the question of how aggressive uh, should we be. Uh, I don't have any uh, disclosures. This is a 51-year-old woman uh, who lives here in Minnesota. She works as a medical coder, actually, for a hospital up in the Twin Cities. Uh, she's very healthy, no comor comorbidities. Um, she runs marathons, actually. 
And uh, she's a single mother of three. Her children are ages 18 to 25. She's never had any prior surgeries. And in 2016, she had onset of really fairly classic right V2 trigeminal neuralgia with all the typical cutaneous triggers. Um, she actually underwent a couple root canals before finally um, she saw a physician who said, well, you have trigeminal neuralgia and put her on carbamazepine and her pain got better, but it did not completely go away. And by 2018, the pain had spread from V2 to now involving the V3 distribution. And so uh, at that point, she got her first MRI scan and of course, nobody will be surprised to find that indeed she has a sort of a medium-sized, what looks like vestibular schwannoma. Um, she uh, sought a bunch of opinions in the Twin Cities about this, and she underwent external beam radiotherapy. She received 48.6 gray and 27 fractions between October and early December of 2018. During her radiation treatment, she did develop onset of fairly constant tinnitus and some hearing loss. Uh, she never underwent an audiogram, interestingly enough. She was treated with steroids, but her symptoms persisted uh, in terms of her uh, ongoing tinnitus and a sense of hearing loss in the treated ear. And by this year, she continues to have fairly constant, uh, but, but um, classic pain in the right V2 and V3 distribution that sure sounds like trigeminal neuralgia. She's now increased her carbamazepine to 300 milligrams three times a day, and she's still having significant breakthrough pain. She gets several attacks a day, and she feels rather intoxicated on the carbamazepine, and it's really causing her to struggle at work. She feels sleepy and dopey and um, is still uh, having pain. And this is what her imaging has shown. So this is her original MRI scan in October. This is only two months after completing radiotherapy. This was uh, uh, in September, so nine months after radiotherapy. And this is uh, this month uh, when we saw her in consultation last uh, uh, week. And you can see, her tumor looks basically radiographically stable. Uh, she, I'll tell you on the T2, she doesn't have any adverse radiation effect in the brain stem. And these are the higher cuts with the very thin section, heavily weighted T2 imaging. Here's her trigeminal nerve and the tumor butts right up against it. This is her superior uh, cerebellar artery crossing over the trigeminal nerve here and then running to get back to the basilar artery. This is her hearing test uh, now that we uh, just obtained. So uh, she does have moderate pure tone hearing loss, but she has 100% word recognition in both ears. And I would say, honestly, if this test were done somewhere else, I might not believe that, but it was done here and I really trust our audiologist. So she's kind of got the best audiogram possible to be a conventional hearing aid candidate. She has 100% word recognition. If you increase the volume coming into that ear, she would probably have very, very useful uh, hearing. So the question for um, Professor uh, Tadajiba and Professor Golfinos and the rest of the pan panel is how aggressive should we be now? So I think the options are, well, I suppose we could do nothing. And we could give her some type of, uh, we could do a radio frequency rhizotomy or a balloon compression, or we could gamma knife her facial nerve. Um, uh, frankly, I'm of the mind that um, we should do something surgical. So I suppose I could go in and do the least amount of tumor resection necessary to achieve a microvascular decompression. I could say, well, I'm going to resect the majority of the cerebellopontine angle component of the tumor to make sure the trigeminal nerve is well decompressed and then do a microvascular decompression. Or should we take the attitude that, well, if we're gonna saw her head open and fish around in there, maybe we should make every attempt to take all the tumor out and cure her as well as do a microvascular decompression. So just to recall, she's about 18 months following this external beam radiotherapy treatment that she had elsewhere. 
And so far we have tumor control, but is that really gonna prove to be long-term uh, tumor control? So I'll stop there and open it up to the panel to get some advice as to uh, what everyone thinks they would do or we should do. John, John, why don't you tackle this first, then Marcos, then the other panelists. Sure, so Mike, I'm glad to hear you're still using saws and fishing poles when you're there in the operating room. Um, I think this one, you know, fascinating case, we see these. Uh, the real question is, do you think the tumor has really pushed her um, SCA or pushed a nerve up against her SCA? I mean, that's usually when you see it in relation to a uh, acoustic neuroma. I think, you know, depending on what you're comfortable with, I mean, I think you've got to go in there and, and do whatever you can to fix her trigeminal neuralgia. That's her biggest problem. Her greatest quality of life issue here is a trigeminal neuralgia. So you, you know, the, the hardest thing about this is sometimes, you know, uh, when you go in on an MDD, even if you do it right and you're way up top and you leave arachnoid intact over the seven, eight bundle, you can still get a little bit of hearing loss sometimes. Um, so I don't know what happens when you also have a weight on there. I mean, it just doesn't come up that often. Um, but I think you're gonna make her very happy if you take it. I think you, I would take out at least as much of the tumor as comes easily. Uh, and if things are going well, I'd sort of keep going up to the point where, um, you know, you still think you have an intact cochlear nerve there and, and uh, probably follow her ABR or direct, you know, direct nerve action potentials if you can do that. Um, so you have some real-time feedback on that. But I think the other thing you got to worry about in this case um, is closure because she's had real radiation. That's not fake radiation. She had multiple fractions. And when you ask me, is she going to do well with the radiation? I have no idea. And I don't know what happens after 27 fractions like that. I mean, but she, I would think she's at risk for a secondary tumor 20 to 30 years from now after 27 fractions of radiation up there. And so this is very different from radio surgery. She had actual real external beam radiation. And, you know, that's being done in some centers now with the thought that it's better for hearing preservation, but I still haven't seen a convincing set of uh, data that shows that that's true. So I would, I would go in there and fix her, do an MVD and fix her treadmill around to no question. I mean, she'll thank you no matter what. And even if, God forbid, she loses hearing on that side, she'll still thank you for fixing her, uh, her um, trigeminal neuralgia. So I wouldn't go hog wild on getting the tumor out unless it happens to come easy, which I doubt it will, two years after external beam. Yeah. So, Ma Marcos, can I ask you to address the original indication of radiation therapy and then what advice would you give uh, Dr. So I, I believe this trigeminal neuralgia started uh, before the patient was irradiated, right? So these were the, yeah. these already problem. Yeah. So and the tumor is not very large. Uh, probably there are indeed here two different problems, and uh, not necessarily the tumor is pushing the artery against it, the, the nerve. Not, not necessarily. And uh, I believe um, uh, it's possible to decompress the trigeminal nerve even without touching the nerve, it, 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 the tumor, if the patient doesn't want that, uh, because tumor is, is stable, the tumor is stable. Probably it's possible to decompress the trigeminal without touching the tumor. But in our experience, uh, in 50% of the cases where the tumor had been irradiated before, uh, surgery was more difficult. In the other 50%, it was the same. So if the patient wishes uh, tumor removal, this can be done, but it's a pity because she got the radiation, she has good hearing, tumor is stable. Uh, probably I would try just to do the microvascular decompression. Thanks. Uh, Greg Thompson, Greg, what advice, what, what would you say? Are you muted, Greg? Well, thanks, Jacques. Um, I, I, I would say you don't have to have trained at Pittsburgh like Fred and I did to see a lot of grateful patients after you've uh, decompressed their trigeminal nerve. But I agree with John. I think uh, you're very likely to have a happy patient um, if you do two things, which is uh, relieve the uh, trigeminal compression. And it might be vascular or as uh, Marco said, it may just be the tumor. And then secondly, um, you know, save the facial nerve. And I agree also that uh, you don't have to do a complete decompression, although a 51-year-old, um, it would be um, uh, ideal, obviously, if you could, since as Mike said, you're already there. Um, I think it's, I've had the same experience, experience that um, uh, Marco said at, at 
uh, sometimes it's easier and sometimes it's harder after radio surgery. But in short, I would do what John said. I would I would operate on that patient, decompress the trigeminal nerve, and make a high priority to try and save both uh, certainly the face and and uh, uh, also the hearing. So, I mean, remember, this is fractionated radiation. I am not sure. I don't, I haven't done too many surgeries on fractionated radiated acoustic. We've done it after radio surgery. I wonder what they look like. Are they, is it as evident as an effect as it would be with uh, radio surgery? I don't know. Any of the panelists or speakers? Have so, I, I can tell you my, Jacques, my anecdata, which is my anecdotal data, my anecdata is that um, after radio, after get, after single fraction radio surgery, I haven't had problems. But even after five fractions, to me, that's a different story. You start to see a lot more scarring okay. in the arachnoid. And after 27, that's somebody who got head and neck radiation. Right. I, I, think, yeah. I really tell you that skin behind the ear after it's been radiated, that's not a great situation. Yeah. No, I meant the tumor. You know, the yeah. fibrosis and. Yeah. I, no. No. I think I think it's a lot harder to pull it off the nerve after even after five fractions. After oh. cyber diver, you know. yeah. the, 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 there is a paper from the group of Heidelberg University. They show that particularly in large tumors, fractionation would give the same tumor control rate and better preservation of the nerves for large tumors. So this is what they claim. Do you know what fractionation scheme they're using, uh, Marcos? Are they using three or five fractions? Uh, it's hypofractionation. Uh, but I, I believe, uh, no, it's more than three, five. It's, um, I, I guess it goes through two weeks uh, uh, radiation. Uh, Fred Barker, uh, is it a relative contraindication to do radiosurgery to an acoustic if there is a presence of trigeminal neuralgia? I remember... Uh, Bill Friedman from Gainesville many years ago with their modified LINAC, even he used to say if there is trigeminal neuropathy pre-treatment, that is a surgical case. What, what, what Would you comment on that and comment on, on Mike's uh, questions? Right. I, I think, um, uh, first of all, we, we see a lot of uh, fractionated treatment here, even, uh, you know, two gray per fraction up to a equivalent dose of 48 or 50 like this patient had. And I, I don't think the skin is gonna be a problem for you, but um, I also think that there was never any chance that this patient's trigeminal neuralgia was gonna get better with that. I think if you wanna fix trigeminal neuralgia without open surgery uh, here, um, Procedures on the trigeminal ganglion don't work for very long when a tumor is the cause, and medications don't work for very long when a tumor is the cause, even if it seems clinically exactly like regular trigeminal neuralgia. I think there are people who would say you could treat the tumor with radiosurgery and also give a dose of 70 or 80 gray to the root entry zone of the fifth nerve the way you would for normal trigeminal neuralgia, and that will work. But there are very few groups. I think Doug Konziolka, John, might might be willing to try something like that. But I don't. I've never actually seen that done, so I don't know if it works or not. And I, I don't think the numbers are are very high. What I would do with this case is um, an open operation. I would tell her that I don't think the chances of preserving her hearing, with or without surgery, in the long term are very good at all. And uh, Dr. Janetta used to say, Greg, I'm sure you'll back me up on this, that if the patient loses hearing in the ear and the trigeminal neuralgia is better, happy patient. I think if you, if you, in the old days when we did vestibular nerve sections for many years, you had a patient whose many years was better and the hearing was gone, happy patient. What, what your unhappy patient is the one where the trigeminal neuralgia is not better, even if the hearing is preserved. So what I would do with this is, is decompress the nerve, not just from the artery, but also from the tumor itself, which from the limited views you, you showed, I think is probably displacing the nerve upward uh, into the artery. And it, you occasionally see a, a case where there is no real impressive arterial contact. And so I think just the tumor itself uh, can cause it as, as you sometimes see in epidermoids as well. So. I would do my best to get the, the tumor off of the trigeminal nerve. I, I don't think you'll, you'll find that terribly difficult. 
getting it completely out, I don't think should be a goal of the operation, really. Um, I wouldn't risk the facial nerve at all trying to get the whole thing out. Because th then you have an unhappy patient. You can always come back another time, you know, if, if that needs to be done. But um, to get the trigeminal nerve completely cleaned off, I, I think would be my, my approach. Mike Link, f final comments on your own case, what would you say? Yeah, so um, I think um, my plan is uh, mostly what Fred outlined. Uh, honestly, I had um, one case, one of my colleagues went in uh, on a kind of a similar sized tumor uh, and it looked very much like a facial nerve schwannoma. So he did not take any tumor out, of course. He did an MVD because uh, to treat the patients presenting trigeminal neuralgia. Um, and then we did radiosurgery for the facial nerve schwannoma and she has done miserably. She's had ongoing pain. Um, she's now had um, gamma knife to her nerve, which also didn't work. And she's had a balloon compression, which has worked a little bit. Um, so based on that one uh, anecdotal experience, uh, my plan is to go in and take out the great majority of the CP angle component of the tumor. I told her that I'm going to put her hearing at a lot of risk. Um, and if things are going well, then uh, I'll have Colin open the internal auditory canal and maybe we'll even try and cure her of this. Um, so that's, uh, that's the plan for next week. Okay. Can yeah, I ask they, my partner, Mike? Yeah, I was going to ask you, Mike, Ivan. Yeah, yeah, just looking at the, uh, the MRI that you showed, even though that the overall volume appears to be stable, you see this a lot in, in either gamma knife or fractionated radiation, that necrosis that happens at the center of the tumor at the time point that you showed nine months. And then uh, your last scan there, you actually showed that some of the, um, uh, that tumor was starting to fill back in with enhancing tumor. So what are your thoughts on whether or not that's enough indication that this, tumor, this patient may be failing radiation, even though the tumor site has not yet grown, that you may have active tumor growing back, and that's another indication to be aggressive with the surgery? I think it's a really good point, Mike. Um, it, it worries me, although I will say we often see this where it looks like, wow, you hit the target. And that doesn't, this isn't a bad prognostic finding that you're seeing enhancement come back within the tumor. So that in of itself doesn't worry me, but we're only 18 months after, honestly, a treatment I never would have offered this patient. Um, uh, you know, Dave Andrews at um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, he wrote a paper, uh, I, think it sh I think it was in Lancet Neurology maybe, uh, looking at two different fractionation schemes, low dose and high dose, looking at hearing preservation. But the follow-up in those patients was only a year, and I've never seen the follow-up paper to know what really happened to them. So I, I share your worry that um, uh, this, this may just be the first chapter of this story. And if I can get this tumor out safely and preserve her facial nerve, um, that's, that's kind of my strong inclination, realizing if I do that, the chance at least I'm going to save her hearing, useful hearing, is very low. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Mike uh, Link. Uh, Scott Clifford, uh, who's filling in for Fred Telishi. Scott, why don't you share your slides, unmute your microphone, and uh, go for it. Thank you, Dr. Morcos. Um, so starting out, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Talishi. Um, despite not being able to participate tonight, I appreciate the, the and trust he's put in me to present the case that he and I have put together for this. Um, I'd like to thank the other panelists and, and appreciate certainly their insight of all this. So um, the case I'd like to present tonight is um, an anatomical variant that I think poses this, this question that we've all, all sort of um, posed tonight with uh, whether or not to take a more conservative or a more aggressive approach. And so um, we'll just kind of jump right into that. Uh, I have no disclosures. So the patient history, this was a 45-year-old male who presented to uh, an otology clinic with uh, about one year of hearing loss, primarily in the left ear, as well as non-pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, you can see his audiogram presented here, which uh, demonstrates a you know, mild sloping to moderate severe sensory neural hearing loss in the left ear. And despite that, he's maintained excellent word recognition scores bilaterally. 
we ended up getting vestibular testing on him. He had uh, complained of some uh, imbalance in addition to his hearing loss. Um, and certainly from a neurotology side of things, we, we like to look at this. And so his vestibular uh, testing showed absent uh, C-VIMPs on the left side at both 500 and 1000 hertz with complete asymmetry. So we had near normal responses on the contralateral side, but near absence on the uh, affected side. Um, ocular um, VIMPs were absent bilaterally and then BNG suggested 55% uh, asymmetry on the left. Um, and so from these, we, we put together that there was likely um, not only a partially compensated peripheral uh, dysfunction, but this was involving both uh, the superior and inferior vestibular nerves. Uh, his imaging is displayed here. This is a um, axial of a MRI T1 post contrast. And you can see as we go through the slides here that there's an enhancing mass of the left internal auditory canal that's extending out into the cerebral pontine angle. Uh, on the KISS images here, which uh, were important, um, we can see that the uh, mass is completely filling the internal auditory canal with a very, very small fundal cap. So um, I'd like to pause here. Um, you know, we, we did ultimately decide that a retrosigmoid approach was appropriate for this patient, given his hearing, his young age, and his desire for tumor removal. Um, and so uh, with that, I just wanted to kind of pause and pose to the panelists. Um, you know, when, we, when we got intraoperatively, what we found was that the anterior inferior cerebellar artery was coursing um, over, or excuse me, uh, lateral uh, to both um, the seventh as well as the eighth cranial nerve and was embedded uh, within the dura here at the porus. So um, we had some conversation about what to do with the tumor at this point, relatively small tumor, relatively young gentleman with, ex with good hearing. And so I just wanna pause and um, sort of pose to the panelists how they might address this. Uh, Marco Stetejiba, what's your advice surgically? You're at this point and you have this view. Um, we have uh, published a video contribution exactly on this topic. So you must cut the dura and uh, drill a little bit bone and you must displace the ICA together with the dura. Um, you should not try to detach the artery from the dura. The artery will, um, it's a high risk of rupture. You must cut the dura and displace the dura together with the, with the artery outside. J John? Golfinos? Yeah, so yeah, you know, you, you get in there. The other thing that's sort of interesting about this case is um, I always say that the MRI never lies, and sometimes we just don't realize what we're looking at. So you, you can find this now on a, on, a, on a T2 volume, you know, a, a high res T2 or KISS image, you can see it pre op, and you sort of, you know, you kind of regret it when you see it intra and you go back and you think, wow, I really wish I had seen that before. That said, I, you know, he's still a surgical candidate, I still would have operated on him. Um, and this happens, you know, as Rotan showed very beautifully, this happens because the labyrinthine artery is very short in these cases and comes off right at the porous. Um, so I, I agree with Marcos. I mean, what we do is we just cut the dura, we roll it away. Um, and then the hardest thing is to decide, you know, what are you going to do with that labyrinthine artery? Uh, are you going to sacrifice that? Do you try not to in any case? Um, but now that you're there, I think at the very least you want to take this tumor out, uh, even if you can't save his hearing. And then you've done something good for him. Scott, why don't you go ahead? You're muted. Uh, unmute yourself. And, All right, and Jacques, I, I really apologize, but because it's my birthday, my yes. wife has done a special dinner. So Absolutely. I'm going to thank you all so much. Uh, it was really wonderful. I, I loved it. Marcos, it was great to see you again. Uh, I've got to see the other, the, uh, you got other them. Uh, panelists very frequently, but yeah, it's great to see you again. Um, and Happy uh, birthday. Really enjoyed it, Jacques. Thank you so much. Happy so, birthday. Sorry, Enjoy early. the rest of the evening. Thank don't get it wrong. All the best. Thank you. Happy birthday, John. Thanks. Bye, John. Bye. So uh, as has been alluded to already, um, that is the decision we ended up making. And so what we did was create a dural flap um, from the dura along the posterior portion of the petrous bone there in order to protect that artery while we drilled the IAC, as Dr. Tatiba um, alluded to. Getting the IAC open first and foremost certainly makes your job easier as the case goes on. Um, and that allowed us to, to mobilize uh, this artery for a dissection later in the case. And so um, you can see Dr. Morcos palpating the artery here and sort of uh, seeing that that's, you know, embedded um, at that point. Um, what he's seeing down there in the suction, you can see that that's still part of the CN8 complex there. 
So once the dura is reflected back, um, we came in to, to drill the IAC, but as we started to reflect the tumor from the fundus out towards the porous, we were having difficulty um, getting the tumor out uh, because of how the artery was restricting us. And so um, Dr. Morcos uh, left this dural covering around, around the hairpin turn that we had here and was able to dissect um, the artery away from that. And again, you alluded to, we did see the labyrinthine artery uh, piercing the bone there, and it, it ultimately did have to be sacrificed in order to, to mobilize the complex. So at the end of this, you can see there's nice dural and bone there, and Dr. Morcos is able to take that and completely reflect it off of the tumor. Well done. Yeah, I just wanted to include this. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to include this. Uh, I wanted to include this portion here because it does show that you can still, despite being able to see cranial nerve seven here coming out of the uh, off the brainstem, then then Dr. Morcos dissecting the tumor um, off of it here at the at the porous as well. And we were concerned because of of all the manipulation of the of the artery, you know, during the mobilization process. One of the things that we're able to do now um, is um, some ICG in order to determine whether or not there's still patency of that artery left. So I did want to show a short clip of that here. Um, when we had had the tumor resected and, and put the artery back in it, into its native position. And you can see, um, while we do get some filling here, proximally, um, that hairpin turn at least initially did show, uh, or did, didn't show great filling here. But when we, when we did this a second time, you could see some backflow. So, um, Clearly there were some collaterals, I guess, that had been established. And so despite not seeing great filling at the hairpin and along this portion of the, of the artery, there was still some, some filling distally there. I was concerned. It, it really wasn't filling well. Anyway, post-op, he didn't turn a hair. It, I thought this ICA isn't working anymore, but didn't affect him as Scott will show in a second. Correct, and and so postoperatively, you know, the patient did quite well. Um, he had a normal facial uh, House Brackman one normal facial functioning postoperatively. You know, as we mentioned, you know, having to sacrifice a labyrinthine artery, he did he did lose his hearing immediately postoperatively. Now we're about a month out, and and at follow up, then he's not not recovered any of that. And so, I just kind of wanted to use this, this uh, as an opportunity to to kind of showcase, um, as again as was alluded to previously that. You know, on this KISS imaging, it's excellent. You can actually see here, this is a different patient on the, on the patient's right side, but you can see some of these variants where, where a vascular loop can enter the porous and, and go, you know, almost halfway up through the internal auditory canal. Um, again, I'll kind of show that here. And so um, in our particular case, I, I did ask the radiologist to go back and look at it afterwards. And he said, because of the, how impacted the tumor was in the IAC, there was no really great way to say preoperatively that um, we'd be able to kind of know that this is something to expect. But um, as you all have mentioned, it's just something to be prepared for and to know how to manage appropriately. Um, and then again, just, just to kind of emphasize why this is so important in knowing how to manage the, the, the AICA here, um, that it does have a variable course, um, often does give off the labyrinthine artery as we've mentioned, and that if in the process of trying to get the tumor out, this was to be, well, not intentionally sacrificed, but were there to be any injury to that, there are some significant um, effects to that. So for some of our early learners, just to kind of understand that occlusion of the egg, it can result in things like vertigo, vomiting, nystagmus, as well as damage to um, five, seven, and eight. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Scott. So um, any, any comments? Otherwise, I'll, I'll move on to Fred Barker. Any, anybody? Uh, want? Maybe, maybe one point. Uh, very beautiful done. Uh, excellent. Congratulations. Um, when I have such a case, my problem is to identify exactly the labyrinthine artery. And uh, I have the impression that the labyrinthine artery in such cases uh, is very short. Yes. It's shorter than usual. And uh, there is more risk for damage. Yeah, it's edited out of the video, but you could see the point where it was short going straight actually through the bone. And I, I had to take it, of course, to move the hairpin. Um, yeah. Luckily, we don't have too many of these. Um, okay, thank you, Scott. Uh, I guess, uh, Fred, uh, uh, Fred Barker, I'm going to show your slides and then let me share my screen. And here you go. I should say, Jacques, I don't have it on the slide, but I don't have any financial conflicts. So, uh, 
If you could go to slide one there. Is this how it starts? Yeah. Yeah, so this is a young woman who uh, at the time we first saw her was 24. She had uh, had a slowly progressive left facial weakness starting when she was much younger. And it was never really explained. She didn't have any imaging until age 20, at which time uh, she had a, a schwannoma on her shin and an orthopedic surgeon sent her for imaging of the head and uh, the diagnosis of NF2 was made. And at that time, uh, it was found that her right ear was, was already profoundly deaf. So when she came to see us, this tumor on the left had been growing slowly for a couple of years. Her hearing had been progressively deteriorating to the point where she had only 8% word recognition score in the only hearing ear, the left ear, although a pretty well-preserved uh, pure tone average. And the left side, the side of the only hearing ear, which doesn't have serviceable hearing at this point, uh, has a flaccid facial paralysis for many years. Um, so I guess at that point, I would just ask what people would do with this. Marcos? Um, facial palsy is complete, right? The facial palsy is, is complete and long-standing. So I guess um, it's impossible to save hearing. Um, I would remove the lesion and try um, an auditory brainstem implant. Which, which of the two lesions? Uh, the left one. So the, 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 on, on the right side, she is deaf, but the facial, but she has good facial function, right? The, that's correct. But she's deaf on the right side. Completely deaf, yeah. no, no so, sound perception. Yeah. On, on the left side, uh, she's, uh, she's going to be deaf very uh, soon. And, uh, and tumor is very large, life is endangered. So I would go for maximal tumor removal since the facial nerve is not working any longer and try to put an auditory brain stem implant on this side. If it works, wonderful. If it doesn't work, then we can try the ABI uh, on the on the uh, right side afterwards so in another opportunity. And the uh, question is, what can be done for the facial nerve? Whether there is still some muscle activity to allow, for instance, a masseter um, reconstruction to the facial nerve, something like that. Let me ask you, uh, I can think of two reasons why you might want to operate on the left. One, because it's the larger lesion, and second, because the hearing loss is more recent and you think the ABI is going to work better. Do you, you think one of those reasons is what, what makes you say that? Yes, because on this side we know for sure that, uh, the, that the cochlear nucleus is, is working well. So she has a realistic chance to benefit from the ABI. Yeah, we know that the right side has been deaf for at least four years at this point and possibly mm -hmm. much longer because she hadn't noticed it herself somehow. She's actually an intelligent, very intelligent young woman. Yeah. Anybody else with any different? No, can you um, show the slide, Jacques? Yes. We started her on bevacizumab. Uh, and the left ear, which had the good uh, PTA, but the poor word recognition score improved to clinically normal hearing. Uh, the, interestingly, her facial palsy did not get better and the right hearing did not get better. And a few years went by and the, the uh, weak left side of the face was reanimated with a gracilis uh, transfer powered by the masseter branches, which works very well. Still on bevacizumab, she had an emergent appendectomy, uh, year four of bevacizumab treatment. Now this, this image shows year seven of bevacizumab treatment. Now you see the, the tumor on the right has grown. The space, the brain stem is down to about two millimeters there between the two tumors. And uh, she still has good left hearing. So at this point, we took out the right side uh, tumor 
And during that operation, now it's not her facial nerve moving her face, it's her trigeminal motor nerve moving the face. So we monitored the gracilis, we put needles in the gracilis flap and we're able to stimulate the trigeminal motor branches and demonstrate um, good EMGs in the gracilis from that. It helped us to preserve the gracilis and we put in a sleeper ABI on the right, which she likes to experiment with. And then if you'll show the last slide, Jacques, I might, I might say with that brainstem, she had absolutely no brainstem symptoms, no trouble swallowing, no trouble walking. And at year eight, she got a facial palsy on the other side. She has facial schwannomas on both sides, uh, which was not prevented, still on bevacizumab. And as of the current time, she's in her year 13 of bevacizumab treatment. The left acoustic neuroma is the same size as it was 13 years ago, and she still has almost uh, normal hearing in that year, 88% uh, word recognition. So normally functioning. Her uh, gracilis flaps on the two sides uh, work very well. I, was, uh, I ran into her in the hall when I was with one of my senior residents, and we talked for about five minutes, and then I asked the senior resident, I said, what, what's the matter with her face? And he said he, he knew there was something wrong, but he couldn't say what it was. What it is is that her upper face really has no movement. And during the 13 years, she's learned uh, sign language and, in fact, teaches sign language to young children. And she says they make fun of her because so much of American sign language is facial expression and she can't make uh, expressions uh, involving the eyebrows. Uh, and they, they tease her about it. But otherwise, she's uh, still living a, a completely normal life. Fred, is she one of your one of your original paper patients, or was the... yes, yeah, she's one of the one of the patients who's and but we have uh, quite a few patients now who've been on this for five years, ten years. Their kidney function has to be followed very carefully, and occasionally they'll need a holiday from the drug uh, during which time their kidney function recovers. It may be that <clears throat> that this isn't going to go on forever. You'll notice, for example, that this uh, that that meningioma there in the corner of the left posterior fossa uh, has grown quite a bit during that time. I, I don't think bevacizumab does anything for meningiomas, and it doesn't do anything for uh, lower cranial nerves or for facial schwannomas either. It, it's really uh, specific to acoustics, and some patients with really bad ependymomas. Uh, spinal, uh, you know, intramedullary ependymomas. Yeah, we, we, we've, we've tried Avastin here on some tough NF2 patients. I don't know if Mike Ivan also wants to comment, but I mean, I ha you know, we haven't had any poster child patients to kind of talk about. Uh, Mike, uh, Ivan, do you want to comment? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I would say we would, we would have tried the same thing with Avastin first and, uh, but yeah, we've, we've yet to have such long-term um, benefit that you see here. I think we have two groups of groups where they have preserved hearing for a couple years, but then eventually they lose it, or the group where they just don't tolerate it more than the first month or two, and then they're off of it at that point in time. What was your protocol for stopping and starting during the different surgeries? Was it just a, a month or two, just like uh, any kind of other brain surgery, or is it a different... Uh, the the uh, bevacizumab, you know, the appendectomy, of course, she was right in midstream, and I didn't do that operation, obviously, but the folks who did said that it was, uh, it was okay, and that there wasn't any uh, threatening bleeding. When we're going to do an elective post-fossa operation, we stop at three months before. Uh, thanks, Fred. Uh, oh, I'll stop sharing. And I'll ask, that is a great case, great case, see what we can get lucky sometimes. Um, Greg Thompson, could you share your slides and unmute Absolutely. yourself? Let's, let's go back to you. And, and Marcos, I really thank you for hanging on at such a late European hour. If I'm you know, any, what's that? I'm awake. Very much awake. So Fantastic. interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Well, Jacques, I hope you can see it now. Not yet. Not yet. Let me. No. Uh, 
You're, you're doing the green box at the bottom, share screen. Yes, let me go back and look again. Share screen. It's looking good. Yes, and put it in present. Better now? Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. Okay, well, first of all, thank you, Jacques, for uh, inviting me. I'm delighted to be here with this group. And, and uh, I'll say first that, uh, Fred, that was that last case was great and shows shows the value of the research that you you've done uh, your group there and in Boston. Um, I'm, I have a I'm the last to go and and Jacques asked I think two things if you're last one you should be quick uh, and the second is uh, he also asked us to be uh, provocative and controversial and so hopefully this this case presentation will be a little bit of both of those. So <clears throat> this is a, a seven-year-old boy who was brought uh, to the clinic by his mother because of the family history of NF2. He had told her that uh, he had buzzing in his ears on, on both sides, and she immediately recognized the significance. She brought him, his exam was normal. He had no facial weakness and no, no discernible hearing loss. And in fact, his audiometry confirmed uh, normal hearing. Uh, with a, a 10 decibel speech reception threshold, 100% discrimination on both sides. Um, he had a screening MR, however, based on those symptoms, and that's the one you see on the left. I should also tell you that his older sister, well, first of all, his father um, had NF2, um, a rather extensive history um, and uh, bilateral acoustics, which progressed and he actually died of uh, complications of lower cranial nerve dysfunction and brainstem compression at the age of 34. Uh, the patient also has an older sister who was uh, about 13 at the time and she was deaf in the left ear and already had a large tumor on the right, on the right side. So the mom had had lots of time to think about uh, really how, uh, you know, how a young patient might be uh, uh, managed. So here's a you know, basically a young boy with good hearing, bilateral acoustics, uh, and, a, and a problem that we see often, uh, all of us, I'm sure, young kids with NF2. Um, and so um, do you observe or treat? And if treatment is offered, what treatment, um, including radiosurgery? And, I, and I'll, I should say parenthetically that uh, his dad, or this patient's dad, the one who died at age 34, was diagnosed when he was uh, 15, and he actually had um, uh, stereotactic radio surgery on both sides at the University of Pittsburgh a year apart. When he was 18 and 19, he lost hearing on both ears within a year, um, uh, and then uh, had kind of that progressive course. So um, you can imagine that uh, that was not, even though we discussed radio surgery, which I, uh, uh, I won't. I won't comment yet about what I I recommended, but uh, I will tell you that the, all the options were were discussed. So that's a quick uh, question. So what would the panel do with this, Jacques? I'll let you pick. Yeah, yeah. Mike Link, can you can you tackle this one? Uh, unmute. Yeah, yeah, I don't think there'd be any question. We would just observe this patient after a first uh, a first uh, visit and get a follow-up audiogram and MRI in six months. And what would prompt you to do something, Mike? Large, larger size or drop in hearing or? Uh, it, both, I would say. Um, you know, as you see the tumors grow, and of course, inevitably they will, is what's happening to the hearing. The one thing I'll comment about radiosurgery and also might have applied to Fred's case for the right-sided tumor is we've had a fair amount of success with radio surgery followed by cochlear implantation. So we treat them, we treat them in a bit higher dose than we treat a sporadic vestibular schwannoma with hopefully a higher chance of tumor control. They lose hearing and then you can rehabilitate their hearing fairly well with a cochlear implant. So that's just one other strategy. Fred uh, Barker, advice for Greg. Yes, uh, I mean, we, uh, I had a more aggressive uh, ENT partner years ago, and we tried some middle fossas on cases like this in the same age group. And 
uh, it really hurts to lose hearing at this age, even in just one ear. Uh, you know, the studies show that their school performance is much better if they have binaural hearing. And we wouldn't uh, touch this, I don't think. And I think the role of a cochlear implant in rehabilitating hearing, even if she were to lose it on one side, uh, is a really important one that we didn't know about 20 years ago. But I think we would just uh, watch and wait and see what's going to happen. Uh, you know, we all have patients with huge tumors who have preserved hearing in the ear. And I mm -hmm. think we've gone very far toward the idea that what you need to do is, is fight to preserve the hearing and not let the scans bother you. Uh, M Marcos, uh, as you know, there are very aggressive radio surgeons who have published and made the point that the earlier you treat the tumor, the better long-term hearing result. Should this be applied to the microsurgery since we've put you in the corner of the aggressive surgeon today? Should, yeah. you, should you operate without waiting since you're never going to be in a better position to remove one or both of these tumors? than you are today before they grow, before they grow or before they, uh, he loses more hearing? Or what do you think? So we have a particular program for NF2 patients. So we have an NF2 center here in our institution. And uh, we have many children like this, uh, this case. Um, of course, if this is the first picture and hearing is very stable, we would just observe the case. But as soon as there is hearing deterioration, then we go for surgery. But our strategy is uh, always to open the internal auditory canal to release the pressure on the nerve. And then we perform a so-called electrophysiological guided uh, tumor debulking. So we remove tumor as long as we have auditory evoked potentials. As soon as the potential starts to decrease, we stop resection. So this way we could keep uh, many children longer with, her, with their hearing than uh, if we just observe the case. So um, I don't know whether uh, bevacizumab would be a strategy here, but uh, at least um, if the tumor is so small, I, I don't know whether this would work. But um, we have published a series in the journal Cancers uh, this year with, the, with a series of patients we have done this strategy. Uh, just opening the internal auditory canal, this is the minimal measurement. And then we try to remove the tumor according to the auditory for potential but uh, always uh, trying to preserve hearing. Um, Carolina, uh, can you hear me? Uh, Carolina, who's uh, our newer partner here, did the six month fellowship with Doug Gonziolka. Have you come across cases of children NF2 that Doug may have done gamma knife for? Any, any such experience and what's I your comment? I haven't. And we, we also have, a, a, we had an NF2, um, sort of program at NYU too. So we, they wouldn't necessarily get referred to radio surgery um, right away. So I haven't seen Doug do any of these, to be perfectly honest, in kids. Anybody else wants to comment before Greg tells us what he did or is planning to do? Okay, Greg, go for it. So uh, the reason I presented this was because this is the uh, first patient we treated this way. And prior to this, I would have said exactly what Fred uh, and Mike had said, that uh, you know we would just follow this until there is growth or loss. And really the whole idea is to preserve hearing in the least invasive way for a long period of time. Really what changed this though um, was the mother's experience, having lost her husband and then uh, a, you know, a teenager who um, now had hearing loss in one ear and a, a very large tumor in the other ear and really no prospect for hearing preservation. And this lady had read um, up on our, our middle fossa approaches and outcomes we have, which is basically we, we 
and, and now over 200, but at the time it was uh, just over 100, I think, when we, when we uh, published this in 06. Uh, this is many years after 06. I think he came in, this would be about uh, four or five years ago, four years ago. And we had 80% hearing preservation. And for the smaller tumors, um, you know, the, there are a number of risk factors, obviously. Uh, smaller tumors, um, less laterally impacted, um, uh, and then uh, better hearing. So grade A patients do better than grade B. These are for not for NF2 patients. These are for patients who are, have sporadic, uh, mostly intercanalicular uh, tumors. And of course, those we explained to her, the, those are different patients um, as a group than, than NF2 patients, and we couldn't be sure what would happen. But really with the thought like Marcos was just saying that, that perhaps decompression and a um, BSER uh, directed resection would help. After some thought, she presented to us basically that she wanted us to try and do this for her son. And so uh, my optology colleague, Alex Arts, and I kind of said, let us sleep on this for a while. We thought about it and we figured, well, it's something that, <clears throat> that um, the, the patient really wanted to do, uh, the patient's family wanted to, from his mother wanted to do. And we felt um, that with that BSER driven, monitoring driven resection, we might, it might do some good as he pointed out for, at the very least decompress the, the uh, canal. So that's what we did um, based on these results. And so we picked the better candidate for hearing preservation, which was the smaller tumor on the right side. They both had, as you saw earlier, um, you know, good hearing on both sides with a 10 decibel speech reception threshold, 100% to scrim. And we were able to actually get a, a, a complete removal of, of, the, uh, of the tumor. Now we told her afterwards, we don't know, maybe, um, maybe the, we fully expect that, that, that the growth of vestibular schwannomas in NF2 may be multicentric, it may come back, but you can see on the post-op, which is the one on the, the right, that we had a, uh, a, a very good dissection. And so we were happy with that. We thought perhaps we had changed, uh, at least for a time, the trajectory of his hearing uh, 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 loss. And so came back to clinic, and uh, he was very happy, and his mom, who had really driven this, was happy. But I said, well, that's terrific. Let's just follow you for the next number of years and see how things go. Um, and hopefully that, that right ear will stay, uh, you know, be maintained with good hearing for a long, longer period of time to the left. I was really going to look at it as a somewhat of a comparison. And he kind of shook his finger at me, said, nope, mom says we have to do the other side. And so then Alex and I kind of had the thought, well, if you're successful, what should you do with the other side? Would you recommend treatment or not? So I'm gonna stop there and, and uh, see if there are any comments from the, from the group and see um, before we go any further, what, Fred, what do you think? I don't know, you're gonna roll the dice again? That, that, that <laughs> bigger to me on that second scan. Um, I don't know if that's, just a false impression or not, but it, you know we didn't talk about it. But I think in the it, I I could be remembering wrong, but I think the house group reported that at five years, about twenty five percent of gross total resections, the tumor had already come back on that side. So, what the effect on the long term hearing trajectory is, of course, is is really unknown. Um, I, I don't think you're wrong doing nothing here on the other side or going ahead and trying it and, and seeing what you get. I'm, I'm curious if anybody else has experience uh, rehabilitating hearing. If you do lose hearing on one of these very small cases, presumably a vascular mechanism, uh, whether cochlear implants work or not in that case, you know, I think that's your fallback position here. I don't, I don't think that we would use bevacizumab here because we, we tend to reserve it for losing hearing in the only hearing ear. So although we do ch treat children with it, um, I don't think that we would use it here. 
Marcos, what, what would you say now? Yeah, it's interesting because, uh, you know, this is exactly the policy of uh, Professor Sami and uh, what uh, we um, try to do um, here in our institution is that uh, when we have such cases, of course, we, we don't go for surgery if tumor is stable, hearing is intact and not changing, we, we wait. But as soon as there is any hearing deterioration, we go to operate such tumors like uh, Gregor did. And then if there is deafness on that side, then we are very conservative to the other one. But if hearing can be preserved, like in this case, then we indeed suggest the family uh, to go uh, to the other side and try the same. So this is indeed our, our uh, policy here in our department. So if hearing is preserved, then uh, approximately three months later, we suggest if the family wants uh, that we try the other side. But always, you know, electrophysiologically guided. The aim is hearing preservation, not tumor removal. Greg, tell us what you did just for the sake of time. So, um, after she requested treatment, we, we did. We went ahead and uh, took out the tumor on the other side, and um, we were fortunate again and uh, were able to have it come out. It was actually much, much, uh, even though it was larger, it was a more solid tumor, had a very um, uh, uh, good uh, shape for the, for the resection and got a very satisfying resection, and we were able to get uh, good hearing and facial uh, preservation again. So now I'm just curious to see, you know, the question I think all of us want to know, and Fred really was getting at, I think, uh, correctly, is, you know, how different will this be? What will the, what will the trajectory of his hearing loss, and, you know, will he have multicentric? Will it recur? We don't know, but um, he, he's the first of the four patients. Uh, we actually have three that we've completed. Um, one that only was operated on one side because we didn't think the other side was uh, a good hearing uh, preservation when we looked at it. Uh, even though it, the, that patient had hearing on both sides, we didn't think that the second side would be a very good uh, candidate for hearing preservation. Um, and so there's been an additional patient who's only operated on the one side. But so far we've been lucky and I think it'll probably take a lot of steam out when uh, one of the patients loses hearing. It, it, it is a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of case, and I don't think we probably would have. I, I honestly, even though we had good middle foster results, I don't think I would have pushed for this on any patient until the mother actually really wanted this done, and, and uh, that's how it happened. Let me let me ask you one question, Greg. Sometimes in these NF2 cases, you do the second side, and all of a sudden their balance is just terribly affected. I'm glad you brought that up. That that was actually I didn't I wanted to say and I forgot, Fred. Thank you. That was actually the point that we made to her uh, um, between the first and the second case that we are concerned about the the possibility of uh, you know really causing uh, disequilibrium, and that we kind of almost expected that. That was a really worrisome uh, part to this, and uh, it, you know she was adamant, I think, and very outspoken about it based on her husband's um, experience. And, you know, she had one, one daughter who had progressive growth. And I, it was hard for us to argue against the fact that her, you know, both her husband and her daughter had um, unusually aggressive uh, growth of their NF uh, bilateral acoustics. Greg, thank you. Ended out without oh. it, so we were lucky. Great Sorry. job. Great job, Greg. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, could you stop sharing uh, your screen? Sure. And I'm now the time I'm going to start reading some questions from the audience and I, maybe I can ask selective uh, panelists or speaker to, to comment. I'll start. Uh, this is for you, Marcos. This is from uh, Gotche Hatipoglu Majernik. Actually, she, thank you, Gotche. You, you're with us every week. I know that because I see your comments. Thank you for watching this symposium. So, uh, Marco, she'd like to ask you about venous air embolism and semi-sitting. She read your paper about 
patients who have PFO and could still be operated in the semi-sitting position, but in her clinical practice, they operate only patients who do not have PFO on TTE or TEE, and still having cases with clinical hemodynamic relevant venous air embolism, although we pay maximum attention to correct positioning. I would be very grateful if Professor Tatajiba shares his tricks for these great results on the semi-sitting position. Yeah, thank you for, for, for this question. Of course, this is um, a, uh, a small science behind, of course. So you must make sure that the patient is, uh, um, is not hypovolemic uh, on the day before surgery. The patient gets fluids. The patient must have a good venous pressure and must be positioned like that. As I, I, I told you, the legs must be higher than the, the head of the patient. The surgeon must be uh, careful not to open any sinus or something like that. And during surgery to irrigate a lot and using TEE to detect any bubbles. So using these methods, we have detected any bubbles in half of the cases. In the other half, nothing. And we had, as I told you, decrease of CO2 expiration in 10% of the case, but in no single case we had had problems like uh, um, um, uh, heart problems or, or hemodynamic collapse or something like that. And indeed, there are not many centers doing that, uh, but we, our anesthesiologists, they put the patient sitting even if the patient has uh, open foramen ovale, provided we say, um, uh, we do this surgery better in, in sitting position, like petrocliver meningiomas or large acoustics. Um, then we sit the patient even with the open foramen ovale. So we have done a prospective study on that and published in, in World Neurosurgery. I, I think it's a, a safe method. Uh, for some years we have uh, running um, a uh, semi-sitting course in our institution to teach how to do it. I, I suggest, Marcos, the seats in that auditorium for the course should be exactly the seat that you want the patient to be positioned in. <laughs> this way <laughs> they know how to position. Yes. Thank you. I'll, a question from Nicholas Khan, actually, who is our new fellow who just started today, came to us from Memphis. Nick is asking, maybe I'll ask Fred Barker to comment or anybody else after that. Uh, Fred, comment on hydrocephalus in the setting of moderate and small size vestibular schwannomas. Does it resolve always after tumor removal? When do you need the shunt? What's the mechanism? Just tell us your wisdom about hydrocephalus and acoustics. First, I'll say hi to Nicholas. I hope he's doing well. I met him years ago. A great guy. Um, the, um, the data on that come from uh, an older paper from Canada by Jim Rutka's brother, who is an ENT surgeon who does a lot of acoustics, who says that about three out of four cases will resolve without a shunt uh, if, you, if you do a total removal of the tumor. Um, of course, if the patient has had radio surgery, then you, you just need to shunt them. Uh, in my practice, it's difficult for me to take somebody uh, who can't walk, which is the way they usually present. They usually present as NPH. I've, I've only seen one patient in 25 years who showed up in the emergency room with vomiting and headache. The others all are clinically like NPH. And um, it's difficult for me to put together an operation with a co-surgeon for a large tumor on short notice. So I will often shunt them and then come back and, and uh, do the tumor operation because I don't think a shunt is such a terrible thing. And one thing I would say about the choice of shunt is um, I've had some patients in whom the newer shunts don't do the trick and it takes an older shunt that does not have an anti-siphon device. Uh, so I typically will put in one of the older Codman or Radionics shunts, whatever they're called now, um, where the pressure is actually negative when they're upright. And I had very good results with that. 
Uh, but if it's a mild case and it's not symptomatic, then I will go ahead and uh, usually don't put in a ventriculostomy, just do the case and, and trust that it will resolve. But if it's symptomatic to the point that they're going to fall and hurt themselves or have already fallen and hurt themselves, I, I will usually go with the shunt first uh, just because it's more expeditious. Anybody wants to add anything else to that? I will say that I wish I had experimented with Diamox in that situation, but, but right. I never have. Um, and yeah. I, has anybody else tried that to get to bridge somebody to operation with Diamox? I have not. Um, uh, Mike uh, Link, why don't I ask you this question from Marcelo Platas. Hello, Marcelo from Argentina. Uh, what, what he's asking about the rate of growth. What is it? Do you, what's in your mind is an average rate of growth? Are you still quoting one to two millimeter per year? Is it an outdated number? Is it meaningless, Mike Link? What 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 do you tell patients? I think that's um, I think that's that's a pretty good number to have in your head. If a tumor is going to grow, they typically grow about one and a half millimeters a year on average. If you look at all the results published in the literature, I think the real question is what tumors actually grow, what percentage. You know, if you look at the data from Denmark you know, you would say only about 30% are going to grow in the first five years. When we looked at our volumetric data, meaning a change in volume of 20%, which is a much more sensitive rate of growth, it was much higher, more than 50% of tumors grew in the first two years. Um, and of course, there's always some fast growing tumors and there's some very slow growing tumors, which is why we always get an MRI six months after the index MRI when the tumor's discovered if the patient's gonna be observed. Thanks. Question to, uh, well, anybody. Uh, question from Chiazor Onya. What, what do you recommend if there is no CUSA available? What do you recommend uh, to do for tumor dissection and resection? Anybody wants to tackle this? I'm not sure what country Chiazor is from, but there may, CUSA may not be available. Doc, I haven't used a CUSA in years. Um, I just right. use scissors and, and uh, bipolar. I don't use the irrigating bipolar unless it's a special situation because I think it's fatter the, the, and I don't like the angle uh, of it. I, I use it a lot for hemangioblastomas and things like that. But I think just uh, old fashioned standard instruments are, are just as fast in my hands. And I came out of the back of a tumor with a CUSA once a long time ago. And I think that also has something to do with my uh, preference for not using it. Yeah, I, I agree with you to a certain degree too. I, I, you know, I prefer the control of exactly like you said. And now the CUSA is nice for a massive tumor to save time, but you need to make sure you're in the center. Anybody else on the panel wants to add? To, to this I just point. remember Dr. Roten gave a great lecture about the kind of how to take out an acoustic neuroma and he said he used to put a sucker and then a, just a cup's punch and he would bite the tumor with the cup's punch and suck it out and he called that the uh, original CUSA. Uh, right, right, right. Um, okay, question from Edwin Paez. Uh, when you leave a muscle in the IAC, um, is it a problem if you have to come back? Will it cause fibrosis? Uh, any of you have much experience with reoperating on IAC that you've already plugged with muscle in the past? Mike, Link, you want to? Do you have much to say? We don't that? use muscle. Kind of one of the old, um, I would say, folklore things in otology is that if you put muscle in the IAC, either through the middle fossa or the retrosigmoid approach, it could enhance and look like a tumor. I don't actually believe that that's true, um, but uh, uh, we've always used a, a fat graft and there's no question. I think whatever you put in the IAC can scar in and if you have to go back, it can be a bit fussy. Yeah, re remember actually Rotten's talking about the special way he macerates the fat and puts it in there and had very low CSF leak rate, interesting. Um, Oh, Marcos Tatajiba, uh, can you comment on the, they can read your paper, I guess, but tell them about the dilution of papaverin. How do you use it during surgery? 
Uh, we use the same uh, dilution like in aneurysm, uh, is 1 to 30. So, and we um, irrigate the field a, a lot of time with, uh, with papaverin. And uh, so far we have not done prospective study on that, only retrospective one. And, um, and uh, in this retrospective study, we saw more hearing preservation using papaverin than um, saline solution. And, uh, but another point is trying to keep the mid arterial pressure high between 80 and 90, not below 80. Yeah. Uh, Greg, I'll pick on you for this next question. Uh, how do you manage large hemorrhagic vestibular schwannomas, particularly when there is lower cranial nerve deficit, but no significant mass effect on the brain stem? I'm not sure if, you know, mm. you know. Um, well, you or any panelist, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, I think this was what John Golfinos was talking about earlier when they say hemorrhagic, the, the multiple cystic, you know, loculated uh, large tumors. And, and, you know, what I've seen is that those tend to be more in elderly uh, patients as well. You do see them in young patients, but uh, it seems like we see them quite a bit in elderly patients. And in those patients, uh, as Fred said earlier, uh, you know, remember that a, a working facial nerve usually equates into a happy patient. And um, one of John's rules, I think, was you can, uh, with younger patients, you should, you should be more aggressive. And probably the contra positive is also true, which is uh, with older patients, perhaps less aggressive. So I guess that's a long-winded way of saying, um, if it's an older patient, I would just try and decompress them and not be uh, as aggressive. I'm, uh, if I have a 65 or 70 year old patient who has a multi-cystic tumor, I'm very happy just to decompress it and leave a little tumor. It's much more problematic when it's a 24 year old. And I think um, just patience and, um, um, you know, try and the, the attempt to try and remove it completely, as John said, if it can be done. Um, but really great patients as you're trying to dissect those redundant uh, arachnoid la layers off um, and find the facial nerve. Usually the hearing, the, the cochlear is, to me, seems less difficult, but the facial nerve is often splayed, it seems, more in those. Maybe that's just my experience. Um, so. I had an interesting experience, uh, Jacques, the other day. We seeing more and more of these older patients presenting with symptomatic hemorrhage into a previously unknown tumor and show up in the emergency room with a facial palsy and they've clearly hemorrhaged into uh, you know something and they're on Xarelto or something yeah. like that and their cardiologist says they really need it. And so you have a 75 year old guy with a facial palsy um, and what, what we try to do with those is nurse them along and see if the facial nerve will recover function back to a level where you can monitor it. And we did that recently, and then the guy's face got numb, and it appeared that he'd had a second uh, hemorrhage into the tumor. And so right in the middle of the epidemic here, when half of the, pa half of the patients in the hospital had COVID, uh, we were taking down this 77-year-old guy, <laughs> and, um, you know, with like a two-centimeter acoustic. And, um, you know, everybody's like, what, what is the matter with you? This is crazy. And they said, well, his cardiologist says he has a 3% stroke risk for a month, you know. And it was one of these very bloody kind of cystic tumors, that, and the fragment was getting smaller and smaller and just would not stop bleeding. And I was starting to get kind of annoyed with the thing. And then finally, we came around the back of it, and there was a little branch off of AICA going straight into the tumor. And as soon as we took that, the rest of the fragment just stopped bleeding. And I put some Surgicel on it and that was the end. You know, I couldn't get it off the facial nerve safely. So I think sometimes there's an anatomical reason for this. Yeah, yeah. Um, next question by Jose Nalino. I'm gonna just twist his question a little bit. Hearing preservation between middle fossa and retrosigmoid. Uh, to the panelist, if a patient asked you for the same size tumor to compare both approaches, presumably a small intracanalicular tumor. Uh, I know what Greg would answer because Greg's experience shows 
correct, Greg, better hearing result with the middle fossa. Uh, Marcos, you, I don't know, I mean, are you qualified to even answer that since you only do <laughs> retrosigmoid? I, I bet, why would you answer a patient if they ask you this? Marcos. Um, maybe, maybe I start with, a, with, a, with something uh, negative. I, I don't like middle force approach on the left side because of potential risks of uh, cognitive problems and so on. So if it's on the left side, I, I would um, suggest the patient retrosigmoid approach. So uh, using the, um, the application of endoscope, you have the same visualization like middle force approach on, on retrosigmoid transmeatal uh, dissection. So the, the, the disadvantage of uh, retrosig is that you cannot open the entire canal, otherwise you open the labyrinth block. But if you have the endoscope, you, are, you have the possibility to see the fundus uh, without opening everything, you know. So, in my opinion, with this technique, uh, endoscopy, uh, in addition to microscope, we can replace, sorry Greg, <laughs> but we can replace the middle fossa approach. So, um, I'll, I'll, can I just say one thing? First of all, I've been to Tubingen and I've seen uh, Marcos operate and I'm sure it works beautifully for him because he's a terrific surgeon. I'll say the two reasons I like the middle fossa approach. One was what he said that you can get a, a complete lateral view from the middle fossa side. And secondly, I, I found actually this is a reason some people don't like it, but I really do, which is most of the time when you do the middle fossa approach, the facial nerve is sitting right on top of the tumor. You can see directly right at it all the way lateral. You just sharply dis um, dissect on the posterior side of the facial nerve and rotate it forward out of your way like a bucket handle and then the tumor the, the cochlear is obviously underneath and the tumor comes out uh, relatively easily so i for those two reasons that, that i prefer the middle fossa uh, i will stop the questions i'll leave it open for last minute couple of questions carolina mike ivan anybody wants to ask anybody else a question uh, yeah, Dr. Uh, Taragiba and, and Dr. Parker, I know you guys were both on the nemotapine trial for, uh, for facial and hearing preservation. Is that something that you utilize still in your practice or how has that changed your practice? Uh, I use nemotapine uh, both for uh, acoustics and even for MVDs, anything where I'm trying to preserve hearing, to be honest, even though the the evidence isn't there for it. I, I don't use the hexastarch. Um, and we give it while patients are in the hospital. We don't try to give it as an outpatient. It's very expensive. They don't like it. And it's hard to find a pharmacy that carries it. So we, we just use it while they're still in the house. And, and um, we, we use antivirals as well. OK. So uh, in our trial, we have done um, nemodipine intravenously, but the patients uh, don't like it. <laughs> so we use only topic solution, nemodipine or papaverine. I think this is sufficient. Yeah, but um, I, I've got a question to Fred um, regarding antiviral um, uh, treatment uh, to avoid um, delayed facial palsy, right? So. But, but do you really see less uh, delayed facial pulses using that? You know, I'm not, I'm not completely sure. I mean, I, I uh, first uh, learned this in Pittsburgh where I think they were still maybe, Greg, giving a cyclovir in our day, which um, is hard to give IV. It's a big fluid load. We, we give famvir. Um, I, the thing about a delayed facial palsy, once they get out of the hospital, if they get a, a facial weakness two weeks later, I think I've only ever seen once where that didn't get better, all the way better and pretty promptly. So I don't think it's life or death whether you are preventing that or not. I have seen patients get readmitted and, and we do a lumbar puncture on them and find virus in the, in the CSF. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think, I mean, we've given it to a lot of patients. I don't think we've had any side effects or anything really, you know, alarming with it. So we, 
I don't see much downside to it, but I think if you had to live without it, I think you could. We'd, once in a while, somebody has an allergy to it or something, and, and I'm not sure how much difference it makes, really, but, but my ENT partners like it. The thing about the Pittsburgh experience, Greg, was um, they had a lot of patients with cold sores after manipulation of the trigeminal uh, route. And I have to say, when I first came to Boston, I, I didn't use it, and we, we don't see that here. I don't know why. Okay, I think it's 7.30, two and a half hours is quite a bit. Thank you for sticking with us. The big prize goes to Marcos Tatajiba. Well, actually, and to John Golfinos to come here on his birthday. Oh, Marcos, uh, thank, you. thank you for staying up so late. Uh, guys, ladies, audience, goodbye. Thank you so much. Fantastic session. Yeah. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah.